Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, January 7th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, professor of history from Princeton University, Kevin Cruz, and Professor Julian Zelizer on their book, Fault Lines, A History of the U.S. Since 1974. Meanwhile, breaking conservative news reporting that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez answered to the name Sandy well into her college career. Man, we're, I think we gotta be honest about hard, how hard this one is gonna be for us. We gotta talk gonna later be a about lot to deal with. Meanwhile, the shutdown on verge of cutting food stamps, delaying tax refunds, meanwhile, ICE agents are spending more time at their other jobs, but deportations continue. Two gerrymandering cases head to the Supreme Court. Independent commissions could be in the crossfire. Meanwhile, just steps from where we are today, a trial to protect Haitian immigrants, about 50,000 of them under the temporary protected status begins today. And John Bolton says, uh, about that Syria drawdown, not so much. And congratulations, we're now sending troops to Congo as U.S. troops are in war zones is on the rise. Less war, less war. DOJ admits they were wrong in their report linking immigration with terrorism, but can't be bothered to correct it. Congresswoman Jayapal introduces statutory pay-go repeal. And Trump makes the big move from concrete to steel. All this and more on today's Majority Report. A sort of surprisingly light news day today. Um, we will get to some of these stories. But literally, on the top of like some news feeds, you will see this story about AOC, or should we say S slash AOC, right? Sandy, well, well, let's, well, I, I wanna save talking about that, I, although I can't, it's so compelling because it's so unbelievably We ridiculous. need to get out ahead of this. I don't know why you guys yeah, are being so complacent. I understand. Complacent. Gotta circle the wagon, yeah, as a wise man once exactly. said. Let's not bring that up now. We'll bring it up uh, later. Um, <laughs> Jamie is uh, uh, ill today. Um, so, um, but the rest of us are here um, looking forward to Sunday where we'll see at least uh, 350 of you at the uh, live uh, Majority Report show. We're, um, we're not going to stream it live. I, I don't know what we're going to do with the video. I don't know yet. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe we'll, uh, you know, share it with members at the very least. Uh, we, we will see about that. Um, I want to tell you that support for today's show comes from Third Love. They use millions of real women's measurements. Third Love designs its bras with breast size and shape in mind for an impeccable fit and an incredible feel. All you got to do is you just answer a few simple questions from Third Love's Fit Finder quiz to find your perfect fit. Third Love offers double the number of sizes that most brands offer. Cups A through H, bands up to 48 with lightweight 
memory foam cup straps that won't slip, and tagless labels. You'll want to wear these soft, breathable bras and underwear every day, especially the new cotton T-shirt bras and underwear. But thanks to the 100% fit guarantee, returns and exchanges are free and easy. Uh, I uh, do not uh, wear bras, uh, but a uh, friend of the show uh, writes back and says, um, the fit is great. I usually have to return most bras I order online, even though they're in my size. I ordered two and both fit. That almost never happens. Super comfortable for an everyday bra, but not as boring as most T-shirt bras. Subtle, cute details, so I don't feel basic. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now, they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. You should buy a bunch, right? Because you can return the ones that you don't want. Go to thirdlove.com slash majority right now to find your perfect fitting bra. Get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash majority for 15% off today. Uh, also, folks, there's no need to suffer through another sleepless night. Calming Comfort by Sharper Image is the luxurious weighted blanket that helps you relax so you can fall asleep and stay asleep naturally. Saul and I literally fight over this. When he crawls into bed with me, you know, I'm, uh, I'm with him half the time. When he crawls into bed with me, it is always because he wants this blanket. It's designed with high-density comfort fill. I never thought about why would you ever want that, like a weighted blanket. But uh, it makes it, sense to me. It turns out that it makes you sleep better. I mean, like you knew it, I think, because I used to layer a bunch of different heavy blankets. Yeah, that's me. what I'm thinking intuitively through the layering. Yeah. But it's designed with high-density comfort fill to provide exactly the right amount of weight to help relax your body. It mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged and helps the production of serotonin and melatonin. And generally, I don't like being hugged. But when I'm uh, sleeping, <laughs> you can sleep better, you feel great, stress less. Plus, made with super soft, velveteen material, calming, comfort, 100% machine washable and dryer safe. The calming, comfort, weighted blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee from Sharper Image. You get 90 days. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to calmingcomfortblanket.com. That's calmingcomfortblanket, all one word, dot com. Use the promo code majority at checkout. Receive 15% off the displayed price. That's calmingcomfortblanket.com, promo code majority. And because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep, go online now. Calmingcomfortblanket.com, promo code majority for your special discount today. And... Lastly, uh, we're not quite there yet. But has your company outgrown QuickBooks? Are shared spreadsheets, manual processes, and legacy systems costing you time and money? I mean, I'll tell you something. I, I know a little bit about legacy systems because we switched from a membership uh, a while back. And that is, that whole concept of legacy systems, I mean, you know, nothing's ter terribly sophisticated around here, but it, it's a problem. It'd be nice to be able to sort of wrap it all into one. Now, uh, NetSuite by Oracle is a business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform. With NetSuite, you can save time, money, and unheeded, unneeded, I should say, headaches by managing sales, HR, and finance, and accounting instantly right from your desk or even your phone. Thousands of the best known and fastest growing companies use NetSuite to manage their business, and now it's available to you. That's my goal for uh, 2019, to get big enough that we need NetSuite. And, and only HR is gonna talk to you guys. No talking, uh, only on the show can that you talk to sounds great. Because right now, NetSuite's offering you valuable insights to help you overcome the obstacles that are holding you back for free. Don't miss out on unleashing your business's full potential with this free guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. <laughs> I know what they I know what they are here though, right? The five barriers. Yeah, the five barriers to growth. Uh, the Never mind. Us? They don't have to say. I was gonna... <laughs> 
You'll learn how to acquire new customers, increase profits, and finally get real visibility into your cash flow. Get NetSuite's guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth, at netsuite.com slash majority now. That's netsuite.com slash majority to download their free Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth guide today. Will you stop typing? I know you're going there directly. Yes, I am. netsuite.com slash majority. I want to apathetically steamroll over those barriers. Oh, you're going to be uh, totally apathetically steamrolling over that. Um, we're going to have a limited edition poster, I think, at the um, at the uh, live show. That's uh, we're going to add that uh, that that phrase to the poster. I think. <laughs> uh, folks, if you have any experience with LifeLock, send us an email uh, at majorityreporters at gmail .com. They want to advertise, and I want to. I, I just I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, send us an email at uh, majorityreporters at gmail.com. Uh, meanwhile, let's uh, go. Uh, we have this ongoing situation now with the, uh, the, the shutdown, and it is uh, ostensibly about Donald Trump and uh, his sort of pathological desire for not even a wall, but to say that there is a wall. Now, I understand why Democrats are not, constantly raising the issue of Mexico paying for the wall, because that's not the only problem with the wall. For, the, for a lot of reasons, uh, it sets a bad precedent. It is, um, uh, a lot of people find it morally reprehensible, the idea of building this wall. Aside from the fact that a wall is ineffective in certain areas, it's unnecessary in other areas, it is contrary to really what our immigration, our overall immigration um, policy should be. And, of course, $5.6 billion will not get you any semblance of what he's talking about. This is all performative. I contend, as I think we did last year at this time, maybe a little bit earlier in the year, that trading $5.6 billion dollars and let him have his, his ability to say to his uh, people, like, I'm building the wall, is worth a permanent status for DACA recipients, a, a path to citizenship, and permanent protected status in this country. Uh, that is a trade I would make. Don't know if it's on the table, because you got to remember, for Trump, the wall is everything, just for whatever bizarre reason. But there's a lot of people in his administration who really genuinely don't want any more brown people coming into this country uh, and want less brown people here. That is why there is a lawsuit to protect 50,000 Haitians uh, just steps from where we are who are here largely as a function of a 2010 earthquake and uh, was a cholera outbreak that followed that earthquake. Uh, and they've been in this country under a... Um, a protected status. May I just add, a, a human-created cholera outbreak having to do with foreign forces there. So, um, but regardless, uh, you know, human suffering. And I don't, you don't hear a lot of people walking around going like, man, everything would be so much better in this country if it wasn't for those 50,000 Haitian people who we allowed to be here because their homes got destroyed and have now built families here and roots here. That aside, here is Donald Trump talking about the wall. And now it's really like it's getting so granular that he's literally getting into the materials. Here it is. And as I told you, it's going to be a steel border and that's going to give us great strength. They don't like concrete. So we'll give them the steel. question was, what, why do you think the Democrats are going to be OK with a steel border? And. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because, like, you know, he was a, he, he, he would visit building sites. And so it was just like concrete and steel. Those are the two things. Like, if they had worked with brick, maybe it would be a brick wall. Just trying to get the deal done. Here we go. They don't like concrete, so we'll give them steel. Steel is fine. Steel is actually, steel is actually more expensive than concrete. But it'll look beautiful, and it's very strong. It's actually stronger. It just doesn't. 
It's unbelievable. And, and, and there was a big story in The Washington Post about apparently no one in the administration was really aware of what would happen with the government shutdown. They all believed their own sort of delusion that it's not relevant. We, we have a situation where government workers at this point, they have not, they have not missed a paycheck as of yet. They get paid uh, biweekly, excuse me, bimonthly. So my understanding is they have not missed a paycheck, but they also all know that their, their paycheck at the very least will probably be delayed at this point. And people live paycheck to paycheck. And there's no guarantee they're all going to get paid back. Who knows how long this is going to last. But as we get closer to February, when you have farmers who have not been able to get their loans, haven't been able to get their slush funds, you're going to hear people like Joni Ernst talk a little bit more about this. You're going to hear uh, Republicans, um, maybe in Kansas, talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Shelly Capito in West Virginia. When food stamps and other federal assistance starts to get undercut, you're going to start to hear about this. You won't hear it in Kentucky, even though that they will be suffering because Mitch McConnell is not a human being and Rand Paul has to pretend like the federal government doesn't do anything. You're going to hear Susan Collins talking more about this. And at one point, that they're going to they're going to they're going to break. Hold up. So uh, we will continue to follow this. What's this next one? Is this him <clears throat> talking about the? Uh, July. Yeah, let's go to number two, okay. because here is Donald Trump saying something that I don't think anybody believes, <clears throat> even his own people. I'm not even sure his own people would be happy about it, frankly. But uh, it's a little bit. Um, but listen to it. to the pain of federal workers who can't pay their bills. I can relate, and I'm sure that the people that are on the receiving end will uh, make it justice. They always do, and uh, they'll make it justice. People understand exactly what's going on. But many of those people that won't be receiving a paycheck, many of those people agree 100% with what I'm doing. <laughs> Did you hear that? I mean, it was hard to hear, but he said... Yeah, I can relate to not having that money. And people will make do. They always do. They always do. And in fact, many of those people who are not getting a paycheck agree with me. I can totally relate to that. It's like when dad says, give me a couple of days before I come in and cash out your casino. And you're like, whoa. Whoa. I'm in a tough spot here because I have a couple of assault victims to pay off and <laughs> there's about a 48 hour window, but you make adjustments. I get so many but letters and oddly from pe from my own stationery from people who support everything I'm doing. <laughs> the handwriting's so similar. You know, there's a lot but, more but, unity but in this country. This is not unique to Trump. That notion of people will make do, they always do. In other words, like, Nobody's come and tried to burn down my house. There isn't like masses of people who have come to try and burn down my house or pull me out of my home or there. I don't see the people, you know, if I don't see the suffering in front of me, it must not happen. They must be able to just deal with themselves. I mean, that is that sentiment put aside the, the, the uh, complete total lie that any of the people not receiving their checks are in favor of this. But that sentiment that they'll work it out, they always do, that is exactly the sentiment that has been shared by um, the wealthy in this country, largely speaking, for decades, that it'll be fine. They'll get by. Look, we all have struggles. And, uh, you know, I remember that time where uh, that person broke up with me or I had that argument with my uh, my mom. That was hard. 
And the idea that, like, well, they're not sure if they'll be able to pay for their kid's dental appointment next week or um, don't know if I'll be able to buy presents for them for Christmas because we may not have money coming in for weeks or we got to cut back on the heating or, you know, it's just going to be uh, rice and beans uh, because uh, we, d we only have so much money or uh, they're going to repossess my car or we're not going to be able to make a mortgage payment. I mean, all of these things, eh, they'll get by. They always do. Millions of people lost their homes in the wake of the financial crisis because there were thousands of bankers who were like, eh, society will absorb the problem. That's the mentality that is not unique to Trump. He's just, he's just too stupid to realize, like, I shouldn't say this out loud. All right, we got to take a break. When we come back, Julian Zelizer and Kevin Cruz on their book, Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program both Professor of History Kevin Cruz and Professor of History Julian Zelizer from Princeton University. Uh, both you guys have been on the show in the past. You're back with a new book, Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. So, all right, um, uh, Kevin, let's start with you. Um, wh why? All right. Well, why don't you l just l uh, list That's out? That's a big question. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a couple of them. <laughs> but um, let w list for us what the fault lines are that you two discuss in this book. And I know this came out of a, a, a class that you were teaching together. What, what are those major yeah. fault lines? Yeah. Well, so there, there are four, uh, well, there are fault lines in two sense. And first of all, there are, there are four big lines of division that we trace through modern America. And these are fault lines of political polarization, 
uh, economic division and economic inequality. Uh, uh, race is another big one. And then gender and sexuality is another one. But we also mean fault lines in the book in a different sense in that it's, it's not just about these lines in American society, but it's about the lines we tell each other about who's fault for the current situation. And so the media is something that sweeps over all four of those big categories. All right. And uh, Julian, why 1974? Well, the obvious event that happens that we kind of take off on is, is President Nixon's resignation, which is a huge issue. It's a traumatic event for American society. And, and in that year, a lot of the different problems that were building in America from, from the aftermath uh, of, of Vietnam to Nixon's corruption uh, and the economic decline of the decade are all coming together. So we thought really that starting with that moment was a perfect way to launch readers, launch students uh, into this new contemporary era. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me from a from a contemporary era standpoint. But is when we talk about the these these fault lines for a moment in terms of just like, uh, you know, dividing lines in which people sort of, I guess, either um, self-select or, um, you know, uh, become sort of a. I guess, a, uh, a, a plane of identity, right? Or, uh, you know, one of the masks, I guess, maybe, or, or, or uh, costumes that they wear. I mean, we've had some pretty serious fault lines, right, since, you know, pretty early on in the American project, right? I mean, the, I guess, the culminating in the first Civil War. Um, why, like, what is different I- from that era as opposed to sort of the post-1974 era. Why don't you, Julie, why don't you take a tack at that, and then, uh, and then Kevin? Well, really what's happening in the early 1970s uh, and, and at the moment when Nixon steps down is you see institutions that have been really important in American life, certainly since the New Deal in the 1930s. They had, they had really defined the country, the, the role of the federal government uh, in in economic life uh, and and in, and overseas, the union-based manufacturing economy, certain concepts of the family, all of these are really coming under fire uh, by the 1970s. Uh, there is a real lack of trust in in many of the institutions Americans had, many Americans had uh, held on to during the period. So so it's less that. All of a sudden, uh, there are these sharp lines that emerge out of nowhere in 1974. It's rather these institutions that had helped push against some of the tensions you're talking about, um, even if they did so in shallow fashion, really started to enter a decade where where they no longer held the same weight that they had done for the previous decades. Uh, Kevin, I mean, the... So we have a situation where all of these different sort of, um, um, I guess, priorities or the way that people address, you know, themselves in public become aligned in such a way that it, we, we have basically two different sides, right? Um, how much, and, and I ask you this, you know, uh, having uh, you having written um, uh, a book both on, on, on religion in, in our history and uh, particularly like the uh, white supremacy um, in terms of uh, the white flight, how much of it was that following the um, uh, the Civil Rights Act and 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 Johnson's you know um, and uh, saying that we're going to lose the South for a generation? How much of this was that everything sort of became, on some level, filtered through race? Yeah, a lot of it is filtered through race. Uh, and, and so what you see here is that, uh, and, and that, that, that's an instance where there was an old fault line, clearly, but of, of fault lines of segregation and discrimination. And a lot of ways people celebrate that line being healed. But what happens is, uh, starting in the 1970s, uh, there's this move towards diversity, this move towards cultural nationalism, this move towards really separatism across the board, um, um, white, black, Latino. There are new forms of identity that really take hold, and there's less of a of an instinct to, to move to the center. So, so race does become uh, a driving force here. Uh, but it really is, it, it's really one of many. I think it really seems prominent to us in this moment right now when white nationalism has really seen a revival. Uh, but if you look across these past four decades, there are different moments where different issues uh, really move to the forefront. Uh, we just have to be in one where I think race is really at the, 
uh, is, is really up front. All right. Well, let's go through. Um, I mean, some of those um, those four, I guess, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess uh, fault lines and, and, and what for you in terms of like pol- uh, political polarization since 74, uh, Kevin, uh, most exemplifies or, or or there was an event or a crisis that um, you could relate to that particular fault line. Well, I, that's a great question. I mean, there, there are countless ones we could use. The one that I think is really um, uh, illustrative for me is, the, is really the 2000 election, and not just in the way in which it uh, revealed uh, the, the, how closely divided the nation was in terms of its politics, but it gave us a language to talk about it, right? Uh, when those electoral maps stayed up, for first, you know, overnight, end of next morning, and then on into weeks, uh, and finally it was you know, December, and we're still looking at the same maps, we came up with a vernacular of red states versus blue states, right? That was uh, new so then, right? Become... Was, that, was that new then? Because I don't recall it prior yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. It used to be that, that the networks would do whatever they wanted. So, you know, uh, uh, when Reagan gets reelected in 1984, um, uh, I think David Brinkley uh, on his show talks about how the map looks like a giant blue California swimming pool, right? Uh, uh, and so the network had flipped back and forth, and that just happened that year uh, that the color red was given to Republicans, the color blue was given to Democrats. You go back past years, and um, I think Time Magazine in 1992 shows Bill Clinton's election, and all the Democratic states are red. Uh, mm-hmm. But just because 2000 was the one where we kept talking about blue states, red states, blue states, red states. It's like a Dr. Seuss uh, rhyme, right? Uh, it becomes cemented in people's minds, and it, and it gives a sense that these are two real warring camps. They, they literally have turf. Well, uh, Julian, what do you think about that? For you, is that that same moment or, uh, or a different one? Well, there's lots of moments. For me, and, and obviously relevant now, is the government shutdown in in 1995 and 96 where where we had had some short government shutdowns but uh during that year you know president bill clinton is in office the republicans had taken over congress in 94 newt gingrich is the speaker of the house and and they have this terrible stalemate where we enter into the longest government shutdown uh that we've had and all of a sudden what would have been outside the spectrum of normal politics just having all these offices closed and services gone is is normalized. Uh, it, it becomes part of how the parties are going to do their combat. Uh, in that case, the major issue was Medicare funding. Uh, and so for for me, it, it's it's a policy battle that really captured where where the two parties were moving and and in some ways, you know, explains the path to where we are right now. If Newt Gingrich was never born, would we even be having this interview? We probably would. Look, every uh, issue has a certain person who who embodies, uh, whether it's the divisions or the sentiment of an era. And and Gingrich was certainly not only someone who embodied it, but he was really a pioneer in the style of of partisan warfare that we have. But but the partisanship really was rooted in, in many things beyond a person. It was rooted in the way districts were being drawn. It was rooted in the way parties reorganized their primary system and the way things worked in Congress. It was rooted in the dramatic changes in the news media that take place. So I think that's part of what we're trying to say. This is four decades in the making. It has multiple factors, and that's in some ways why the bitterness uh, and the divisions are so intense right now. Kevin, let's talk a little bit about uh, gender and sexuality, because um, uh, how I mean, how much of 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 gender and sexuality is a function of sort of, you know, what we I think, you know, we would call in the 60s, the women's liberation movement, um, the, the divides there. I mean, how much what how does that play out and what events do you see? Because to me. It seems like the 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 birth of the moral majority, right? Like the the, the these things get weaponized in some way, um, as opposed yeah. to just being out there. And that, to me, seems to have weaponized it in some fashion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, I think you can trace uh, the origins of, uh, of these dividing lines to uh, to the new prominence of feminism. That's not to blame. A feminism for uh, for what we've seen, but but it sets up a, a chain of events. 
Uh, feminism itself, at least in terms of its, its prominent role in the 1970s, is in a large way a reaction to how bad the economy is. Uh, by 1976, uh, only about 40% of all jobs provide a, a salary that's good enough to support a family. So you have a lot of uh, you know, suddenly of both uh, husband and wife are working in the workplace. And as those women move into the workplace, they start to experience uh, uh, discrimination and sexual harassment and all that. And so feminism really ramps up uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the 1970s. And then in reaction to that, you have this new movement of family values. And at first it seems uh, like the, the, the drive for feminism, the drive for equal rights is going to be a no-brainer. If you look at the course of the Equal Rights Amendment when it comes out of Congress, uh, you know, it had been in the works since the 1920s, but once it finally gets out of the Congress in the, in the early 70s, it seems like it's going to pass uh, and get ratified uh, immediately. You know, several states do it within the first day. Uh, but what happens is that uh, Phyllis Schlafly, who graces the uh, part of the cover of our book, uh, kind of ingeniously uh, uh, turns the issue around and says, uh, this isn't a measure that's going to give equal rights to women. It's a measure that's going to hurt families. And it's a brilliant bit of framing uh, that, that she does. And, and, and so suddenly you have, uh, you know, who could be against equal rights for women? Well, she frames it as, as it's going to be uh, an attack on families. It's going to be an attack on the rights of women uh, to be cared for, the rights of women to, uh, to have uh, automatic um, uh, uh, um, child support, to have alimony, to have all these kind of things uh, that will keep them uh, alive and well, that women are going to be grafted into the military, God forbid. Uh, there's a whole host of horrors that she raises. And so it becomes about two competing visions uh, of what America is all about. Uh, and the family becomes a microcosm for the nation. And that sets up a fight that uh, we're, we're, still, uh, we're still having today. Talk just a little bit about the the moral majority, because it, it always strikes me is that like morality became this sort of surrogate, a surrogate for religion in some way. And we see echoes yeah. of that yeah. where people self-identify as evangelicals. They vote for Donald Trump. Um, and it's almost as if like, you know, in many of them are not actually church going, even though they they identify in that way, that it's become yeah. a surrogate for something else. I mean, I. Uh, 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 talk a little bit about uh, that. Sure, sure. Well, so, so the moral majority goes back to something we talked about earlier, which is the way in which there were old dividing lines, like you said, there were old fault lines. And so in religion, what had long kept religious conservatives from uniting is that they had all these different lines, these doctrinal lines between them, right? You know, if, if Baptists didn't like the Methodists, didn't like the Lutherans, didn't like on and on, right? Uh, and so what the moral majority does, where that name comes from, is they finally decide, the organizers of that, Jerry Falwell and Ed Whelan, say, hey, out there is a moral majority who believes at the core in the Ten Commandments. And if we can boil it down to that, what I called in my last book a lowest common denomination, if we can boil religion down to something that simple, that kind of bumper sticker level of religion, um, and not get over the, 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 you know, our different readings of the Bible, then we can all agree, right? So that's what the moral majority comes about, is, is it papers over these old religious differences. But as it does, it injects a new kind of religion, because often they're not going off the Scripture anymore, because that's actually what divide them. And so they speak to this broad general morality. And they get involved in issues that aren't really talked about in the Bible. Homosexuality uh, isn't really addressed at length in the New Testament, abortion uh, the same way. And so they come out and they, they, they seize on these issues, uh, and they inject a, a new meaning in them where they're dictating what is moral and what is not. Uh, and as we've seen over the course of just uh, 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 Falwell Sr. and Jr., uh, that definition of morality certainly changes. And so uh, where Jerry Falwell in the late 90s was saying very loudly, Jerry Falwell Sr., that Bill Clinton had to resign because he committed this extramarital affair, Jerry Falwell now just brushes it off, right? So it, it, it's very much a uh, um, what... Those on the right used to complain about the left. They said, you, said you, you had situational ethics. You know, you had a, you had a, a shifting set of values. Well, now we see that on the right as well, I think. Uh, Julian, talk about these, the, the, the fault lines in the context of the economy. Because that, I mean, I, there, there's clearly a, uh, a major divide, right, uh, in, in terms of, of wealth and, and income inequality in, in this country. But has has it uh, has that become weaponized in the same way in that it's created polarization? I mean, it, 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 like it's it's the least obvious it seems to me within the context of our politics. 
Well, it's really important, and you have to remember that, uh, again, going back to the 1970s, it's a, it's a big sea change that we have during that uh, decade. And, and again, the, the, the period from the 30s to the 70s, you had this very strong economy that created a, a pretty robust middle-class society. Unions were at the core of that society, and economic growth was strong, inflation was pretty low, unemployment was pretty low, and all of that falls apart in the 70s. So the, the two key things that happen, one is you start to see the worsening of economic inequality. So the divide between the rich and the poor starts to become more severe, and that trend will continue right through today. That has all kinds of political effects. Uh, a lot of the money that uh, is at the upper uh, income bracket starts to align with Republican politics since the 1970s, and you see the party shift and embrace issues like supply-side tax cuts, economic deregulation, and, and pretty much line up uh, where those two interests unite well, and Democrats to some degree subscribe to this, but but not not as much as with the Republican Party. So so the the economic divisions and the political divisions uh, work in concert. Uh, and the other thing that happens at the same time is is the middle class really starts to struggle. Uh, beginning in the 1970s, Kevin and I write on. You can see this even in pop culture, uh, on all sorts of shows from All in the Family to Alice. Uh, you, you can see the tenor of the economy changing through what people are watching. And the loss of that, uh, that working-slash-middle-class economy really changes the, the, Democratic, the Democratic Party and, and erodes uh, one area um, that had been really important to the way the parties were set up. So uh, I think the economic and political divisions actually kind of work hand in hand during this period. Um, let's talk about the the media and the media's role in this. Um, and, and again, just like, you know, it's interesting, you know, I, I interviewed uh, John Sides, who had written, uh, who's, uh, who wrote a book, Identity Crisis, I'm sure you're both aware of, yeah, where, yeah, uh, yeah. where, um, a lot of these issues became uh, heavily racialized um, following Barack Obama. The one statistic that, that I keeps echoing in my mind is uh, that 50 percent of uh, non-college educated uh, white folk did not perceive the Democratic Party as to the left of the Republicans on race uh, until Barack Obama was elected. Um, and oh. it, which is. Uh, just super surprising to me, um, but uh, that's what it was, and and that may account for some things. But um, what uh, as these sort of different, um, I guess, identities uh, align in such a way that people just find it easier. I go on one side or the or the other. How does uh, media play into that over the past, I guess, forty some odd years now? Well, it's become a huge change. I, I, the the changes are a the the news cycle becomes uh, endless. It it moves from a period where networks and and newspapers, you know, uh, basically a handful of networks had a very limited news cycle at the end of the day at the dinner hour in the morning papers to starting with the advent of CNN in 1980 and then moving forward this endless. Uh, amount of time for information. You saw the media landscape fragment uh, very dramatically uh, starting in the 80s, accelerating the 90s, both because of cable television and then because of, of what the internet brought to, to the consumption of news. And, and finally, you saw partisan news take hold. Uh, Fox News is, is the story we tell about, which is the most dramatic uh, moment of this with its formation in 1996 and, and just a, a source that's going to provide news from a Republican perspective uh, and, and then not even news, just a form of entertainment uh, since then. And, and so all of this creates a media landscape where the divisions, the partisan divisions, these different kinds of social movement tensions all have a, a great forum uh, in, in which they're going to be covered. Um, information is really hard to control, and so all the different sides can get their stories, facts, and otherwise out there. Uh, and I think that if the media landscape had not been so freewheeling, not so open-ended, and, and not with so many sources that 
are happy or are comfortable with partisanship, uh, you might have had a slightly different story. Uh, but but it worked well, so to speak, with the political fault lines of the period. Uh, Kevin, do you think it was the fairness doctrine ultimately? I mean, you know, as as prominent as Fox is, it was it was I think right wing radio which reached you know, t- uh, 10 times the number of uh, the audience yeah. that, that, that Fox does, and that was unleashed by uh, Reagan's repeal of the Fairness Doctrine. I mean, what what is your sense of that? Yeah, no, the, the Fairness Doctrine, when it gets uh, repealed by Reagan's FCC uh, in 1987, uh, is the pivotal moment when we talk about it in the book. Uh, but, it's, but it's part of a larger, uh, a larger shift, and, and it's not just in terms of the of the fracturing of the media landscape. And that certainly allows it. That that enables uh, the right-wing media to take hold. It enables uh, Fox News to come out. And the the, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, another uh, kind of policy turn that that allows Fox and Murdoch to consolidate a lot of stuff under their uh, their one belt. Uh, You get that that fracturing of the media landscape, but it's also not just where they are, it's how they do it. And so there's, there's a change in the media over time and again, to go back to, to trace from what Julian did, you know, when you have those old three networks, they're all the kind of the staid Walter Cronkite, Doug, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, Brinkley, uh, and and uh, and the others are out there, kind of giving a, a very kind of down the middle of the road line of of, of being objective. Uh, part of the the change is the partisanship. Part of it is also the showmanship uh, that that changes here. So you can look back to someone like Roger Ailes, who doesn't come out of nowhere with Fox News. He'd been active in. Republican media strategies back to Nixon. You know, he's the one who gives Nixon the makeover uh, in the in '68. You know, he says, you know, people look at Nixon uh, like he's the uh, like he was, you know, 42 years old the day he was born. They say other kids uh, got a football for Christmas. Nixon got a briefcase and loved it. Uh, and so he does a, a good job of polishing that dour Nixon image into something more exciting. And then he becomes a mainstay of Republican politics. Rather, he works with. George H.W. Bush, and he's the one who really links George H.W. Bush to Rush Limbaugh, makes Rush Limbaugh kind of an equal partner. Uh, One of the the fascinating things uh, 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 that we talk about in the book is this thing where where it's not that Limbaugh is looking for validation from George H.W. Bush. Bush is looking for validation from Limbaugh. He has Limbaugh to the White House. George H.W. Bush literally carries his luggage into the White House for him. I mean, it's clear who's in charge uh, at this moment. Uh, and so Ailes goes from that, from enabling uh, uh, Limbaugh and the Bush White House, to then crafting uh, this uh, th- th- this new style of, of media in that fractured landscape. So it's not just about having the space to do it. It's, it's how they do it. And it's a much more uh, flashy, uh, much more uh, k- kind of um, a less dour, a less old school Republican view uh, in which they really do uh, they really do go to, to, to dumb it down. I mean, you can look at other people like uh, like Lee Atwater, who was a, a pro wrestling fan, right, and and really craft his campaigns. Uh, the 1988 campaign is done like a pro wrestling campaign. They're going to make George H. W. Bush the hero, Mike Dukakis is the heel, and they're going to stage everything around that. So it really is about the drama that they create. Julian, um, a- a- as we recount this, every name that we have talked about in terms of pushing this change has been a conservative, right? I mean, so. Yep. This is uh, this polarization and, 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 and things are changing maybe in the past five or six years. But but prior to that, it seems to me to be completely asymmetric uh, as to, you know, you know, the, it, it takes two to tango, but it doesn't take two to fight. Actually, one person can just be getting their face pummeled and they're still involved in a fight. Um, you, d- why? Why did the, I mean, is this a is this a simply? I mean, are we just looking at basically some type of uh, return to the mean or just a pendulum switch or I mean, but it, it seems to me that when you look at what's happened in the past 40 years, at least politically, right, uh, in terms of the political process, um, the right has been um, has been very, very active in this regard. Like this seems to have been an agenda as opposed to the willy-nilly of what was going on in the 60s that was less about sort of, you know, constrained electoral politics, it seems to me. 
Well, I'll give you a historian's answer, yes and no. So uh, we definitely push back in the story on the false equivalency that both sides do this the same way and that Republicans and Democrats just got nasty and divided. And, and we make that point that a lot – a lot of the way in which uh, uh, the partisanship moved certainly was was very often driven by Republican strategy and Republican tactics. But but we also don't see the last four decades as simply this shift to the right, a wholesale shift to the right. And we try to emphasize the way in which progressive uh, actors remain really really important uh, in in shaping what the country was about. In the 70s, we cover feminism and and the ways in which uh, feminism impacted not just policy, but the ways in which we thought think about family, the way in which uh, we think about all kinds of cultural issues. Uh, we have a lot on the gay rights movement uh, with the, the, the material on, on AIDS, for example, is I think a really important part of the story in which they pushed back against Reagan and who, who basically ignored the whole crisis. His, his spokesman, Larry Speak, laughed about the issue. And, and it ends up with their obtaining you know, serious research money. And, and George W. Bush pours money into this uh, to fight against AIDS overseas. And, and we have many stories like that where, where liberalism doesn't disappear, liberal policies don't just go away. Uh, and, and that aspect of American, American politics and society is actually really pretty important and, and still influential. Uh, so, so that's where the no comes in, and, and we're trying to bring that back into the story. And some of what we're seeing today uh, is actually rooted in, in these fights and this counter-conservatism that has been uh, an integral, even if forgotten, part of this entire period. Uh, Kevin, is this polarization necessarily bad? Not entirely. I mean, there's 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 something to say for the the fact that you've got this kind of clear ideological line. I mean, I mean when Americans look back to that uh, kind of that what they see as the golden age of bipartisanship, uh, they fail to remember that that happened because both parties were ideologically mixed. You had liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans. You had liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats. So if you were no matter where you are in the ideological spectrum, if you love to get something done, you had to be bipartisan because half the liberals were in your party, half of them were over there. Same with the conservatives. And so um, uh, there's, there's something to, to be said for the, uh, the kind of the clarity you get and having things kind of more uh, clearly laid out. Uh, I do think there needs to be a, a little more sense uh, of, the, of the common ground. I mean, maybe I'm being naive, but, but I think we need to have uh, some awareness here. Uh, it can't be a kind of unilateral. Dis uh, it can't be you know one side disarming uh, uh, and, and not the other. Uh, but there does have to be a point where the, the kind of the, the scorched earth politics that we saw that really um, reached amazing depth under uh, uh, really under Mitch McConnell in the Senate over the last few years uh, really can't be the new norm or, or just nothing's going to ever get done. Well, now wait a second. I, I got. Uh, I want to. I want to put a pin in that last uh, uh, thing. But will you, for for the sake of like people under the age of, uh, of of thirty five who may be listening to us, um, what like how, d what did the party stand for if you had conservatives in the Democratic Party and liberals in the Republican Party? Like what? Why would you vote for one or the other? It often depended on where you were. I mean, this goes back to your earlier point about why some people didn't think that the Democratic Party was uh, to the left of the Republicans on race. If you are growing up in the South in the in the 80s, you may be voting for a Republican at the national level, but your local uh, senator or congressman might be a conservative Southern Democrat who's who's, who's an old Dixiecrat on race. Um, and so uh, a, a lot of those those values depend really on where you were looking. Uh, it only becomes. Uh, later on, when you get a, that kind of more ideological rigidity uh, that you really get that, that clear sense of focus. Uh, there was a lot of disagreement, a lot of debate internally in these parties. And so it varied where you were, what you believed in. I, I mean, in broad strokes, the Republicans were kind of the party of limited government. Uh, and in broad strokes, the Democrats were the party of the old New Deal order of thinking the government could, could solve things. Um, but uh, at a granular level, it got a little more muddy. Well, uh, but uh, Julian... So is, yeah. has the conservatives really been the party of limited government or does that really just translate into the 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 uh, the conservatives are the party who are not going to give stuff 
to people and rights to people who don't look like me. Yeah, look, the, part, the Republican Party is not the party of limited government. That's just a talking point, and, and I hope uh, right. that's one right. of the things that's clear. It's an issue of priority. It's a debate over priorities. Where, where to use government? Republicans have used government on military spending. Republicans have used government to subsidize uh, parts of, of the economy and certain economic actors. They've used government to try to regulate morality, so, uh, and they've embraced the strong presidency. So, so the idea that they're a party of limited government, I wish that could be just put aside. I, I know it won't be, uh, but, but nothing bears that out in this history. It's a debate and it's a battle over prioritizing where government should be used and what the rhetoric about government should be. I mean, they are the party of rhetoric about limited government, even if they're not right. the party of limited government. Right, but, but when we say even, even uh, but, but when we say even like what the priorities are going to be like, we don't have to imagine what those priorities are. They haven't shifted dramatically. It is always don't spend money on anything that uh, helps non-white people or uh, empowers uh, women uh, to, uh, in such a way that they would push back on the power of men. Well, I mean, look, there are... there. That's an argument, and that's an argument some would hold. I think others can see there are certain parts of the Republican history where not everyone's in agreement with that. And, Over the past 40 uh, years? Kevin, tell, look, me, uh, tell me what people – Kevin, you tell me, Kevin. Over the past 40 years, where have we not seen that as a fundamental precept of, of the Republicans? Well, okay, I'll, I'll argue for this. I mean, I think if you look at what, uh, what George W. Bush did uh, in terms right. of, of trying to broaden the party – beyond a party that was that was purely white backlash he really tried to shift it he failed but he tried to shift it away from the old newt gingrich kind of white grievance uh, policies that i talked about in my first book uh and he tried to broaden the party both in terms of of of, of the, the people he brought into his administration in terms of colin powell condi rice alberto gonzalez uh but also in terms of of really trying to bring hispanics in uh, and to say to, to, to say to all latinos Look, you've got a certain uh, uh, culturally conservative values. You're really like us. You believe in free enterprise. You believe in all these values. You're, you're, you're Catholic. You've got the same kind of religious values as many of us. Uh, welcome to the party. And he tried to do that. Uh, he tried to, to get through immigration reform. Uh, and I, I think he, I think it's sincerely wanted that to be. Um, uh, and yet uh, it proved to be that the other forces in this party, the base especially, uh, was simply too resistant to that. Uh, but there certainly was an effort to do that. Right. Okay. But that, but that proves my point, right? Like even the president of the United, even uh, Bush, uh, a, a political uh, mm -hmm. member of a political dynasty, he couldn't even get the Republicans when he knew it was in their, their best interest. That, they, that was the aposty, right? Like he, he couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, this goes back to the point about the media, right? right. So, so this is why the media is so important on this, is that Bush tried to broaden this, and yet the base is at this point really tuned into Fox News, really right. tuned in to Rush Limbaugh, and they're the ones who really put the screws to the politicians on this. And so in a lot of ways, they become, they become captive uh, to the media. At first, Fox seemed to be kind of just cheerleading for the Bush administration, and by the end of the presidency, they're really setting the course for it. And now we've got the, the moment where, you know, uh, Fox and friends and, and Trump are, you know, it's, it's practically he's practically part of his cabinet, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, this has been that way. I, I feel like, uh, yeah, that's right. Fox and friends. I mean, Limbaugh is a little bit um, has has receded a little bit from the popular imagination. I think he's getting tired. Yeah. But um, all right. Well, so, let, so let me ask you this. But like, I think if, so, if I could just jump in, I yeah. mean, I think one difference, Sam, that's important is there republicans until recently did at least try to imagine a way to build a coalition and if you look in the early reagan years it's interesting in that they, they didn't understand why african americans weren't supporting reagan or, or many fem why there was a gender gap but they were at least trying to figure it out and trying to see what they could do at a minimum rhetorically uh to try to to diminish the gaps that were emerging what's striking today is that is totally gone and you have a Republican yeah. Party that's now comfortable being a narrow minority party. 
Um, but I don't think that was always the case. And, and I think this has been building uh, and, and, and getting worse over time to where, to where they are today. It's funny that you say that because I just uh, like, and I don't know if it came from one of you guys uh, or it was just a thread that you're in, but there was a clip of Wally George, who was sort of like a, um, a precursor to Limbaugh on television, who had the rapper TRQ on. His uh, show, who oh, had yeah. been at the the RNC, I think in like '92, um, you know, yeah. pushing back, um, you know, and, and, and so there there was an attempt, like the idea that there would be um, uh, rappers at. Uh, well, I guess you know Trump tries to bring in, um, uh, you know, some uh, some some cred. He has his. Uh, he got it uh, moment, but um, all right. Well, so let me ask you this: yeah. Do either one of you seriously believe that we are headed into a period of less? Uh, uh, there's any potential for less polarization without the defeat of one of the two major parties, like, like, like an enormous defeat, or is it? Are we just going to keep replaying this, uh, Kevin? I'll let you go first, and then you, Julian. I mean, yeah, okay, look, we're historians, and our training is, is hindsight uh, professionally, but uh, but I'll take a stab at this. Uh, I, I think that it is going to have to take a shake-up like that to really fundamentally bring things uh, to, to any kind of, um, of new stability. Uh, I think we'll always have, as we noted, certain kind of fault lines in the country. But as long as as, a, as one of the two major parties, and that's, that's basically the system we have, we've got two at a time usually, uh, well, as long as one of the two major parties is – um, or, or both of them are driven by this uh, this kind of play to the base mentality that has become increasingly uh, popular recently, uh, but but definitely with uh, with with the Trump era, I think we're locked into that. So I think you would have to see uh, a major a major set of defeats. I mean that's almost where we begin the book, right? The book begins with with Watergate and the Republicans uh, being devastated in the 1974 midterms, and then losing the White House in '76, and throughout that period. There's a move out of old Republicans say, say, look, we've got to abandon this party. Uh, they come close to doing it. They come close to setting up what was going to be a new conservative party. William Rusher from National Review uh, is behind this. And uh, uh, he wants to have a ticket of um, who wants to run in 76, Ronald Reagan and George Wallace. are going to be the new conservative icons, right? Um, uh, it doesn't quite come to that. The Republican Party carries on, largely because Reagan helps reinvent it and others on the new right. Uh, but that was the moment that the last order really shook up. Uh, and whether or not the Republican Party gets a complete makeover like it did in the 70s, or uh, it uh, winds up you know, uh, uh, going down in flames with Donald Trump, uh, as, as, as might be likely now, uh, I think it's going to take one of those two things to change it up. Now, Julian, uh, just to, b- before you answer, I mean, based on Kevin's answer there, was not the problem of the Democrats in 76 76- is that they did not go towards their base. After having defeated the Republicans, it was the failure of, of, of then allowing the base to, to drive the Democratic Party, which is what I think left them so vulnerable. I feel like I'm on a game show, but uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> look, I, uh, I, 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 think the de- I think it is fair to say that the Democrats, that Carter moved maybe in the wrong direction in 76 to 80. This was Ted Kennedy's critique in 1980, and that rather than trying to reinvigorate the ideas and traditions of the party and and energize the people most loyal to the party, um, that they moved in this kind of messy, centrist direction, which pleased nobody, and ultimately was not more appealing than the Republican alternative, which did conservatism a lot better under Ronald Reagan. So, so you could argue that that was a, a fatal flaw uh, of Democrats in the late 80s. I would say, though, the, the which one party uh, being dismantled isn't even the answer. I think it's much deeper than that. I, I really think the way a lot of our institutions are working, uh, not simply which party do we have, but the way that parties work, the way that districts are drawn, the way that campaign finance works, and the way that that the media uh, covers the news, all of these have to be reckoned with if we're serious about moving into a, a new era like we did in the 70s. Otherwise, it's going to be the same, and it's it's simply uh, a myth, a false promise to say, well, the next president will make things better. 
Obviously, one president can make things a lot worse, and I think there's a case to be made with President Trump. He's taken all these terrible trends that we have, or damaging trends, and really doubled down at a minimum on them. Uh, but but it's going to be about reform uh, if, if people are serious about wanting something different. Otherwise, it will keep reproducing itself, this, this political system. Oh, Matt, sorry. Oh, that's our uh, bell, which means we're out of time. Uh, got, that was a joke on the uh, game show thing. Um, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite. Uh, they can't all be gems. Um, we needed a gong. But right. uh, the, the book is Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. It's a fascinating book. Kevin Cruz, Julian Zelizer, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, congratulations on the book. Really enjoy it. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us, man. All right, uh, folks, we're going to move into the uh, fun half. That would have been a much smoother uh, joke, uh, Matt, if you weren't uh, checking I I, your... I ruined uh, that one. Your, <laughs> your uh, Instagram feed He's or whatever in the chat. it was. Yeah. Um, I need that bell to come right in. I'm but, sorry if uh, I cost anybody a laugh there. Yeah, that was rough. That was a rough uh, ending, but it's, uh, it's a fascinating uh, book and topic. Folks, uh, that is, in fact, that bell does mean it is uh, time to move on to the lightning round in our fun half. More. Makes me think of lunch. But yes, yeah, that it's food should be ready. I don't know. That's, <laughs> oh, that's a very Pavlovian oh, 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 response, Matt. Because yeah, it's, it's like, a diner thing. Yeah. Like, um, no, it doesn't. Maybe like, yeah, diner or uh, yeah. School. This is when you just you just like you like <laughs> eggs are up. Exactly. My omelet's ready. Yep. <laughs> Folks, this program relies on <laughs> your <su> extra hash browns. <laughs> <laughs> this program relies on your support uh, to do it every day. Um, you can uh, help support this program by becoming a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you go to jointhemajorityreport.com, uh, you uh, also get some extra content and um, access to things sometimes that other people don't get. I'm not going to get too specific. You need to become a member to find out what we're talking about. Uh, but um, Secretive approach. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Join the majority report dot com. Uh, also, at justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY to get 10% off. And listen, uh, for those of you who are New York City residents in particular, we will put a link to uh, Nomiki Konst's um, uh, fundraiser thing, there are like three or four days left where your uh, donations will be matched by the city times eight, up to 250 bucks. So if you give $50, she will get $400 worth of campaign um, uh, money. So, um, if you are interested in supporting her and you're from New York City, now would be the time. We will put that link in the uh, podcast and uh, YouTube descriptions uh, and at uh, majority.fm. So uh, check that out. Uh, today is Monday. Tomorrow is Tuesday. And uh, the Michael Brooks Show happens then. Good transition. Nomiki Konst will be the guest tomorrow. We're talking about her candidacy for public advocate in New York City. Uh, the agenda from fighting Amazon, corporate tax, holding NYPD accountable on a Black Lives Matter agenda. She's got a real serious agenda for New York. We'll be talking about that, plus teachers' strikes, a uh, whole bunch of the Haitian um, pr pr protected status for Haitians court case and the activism around that. On the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel this Sunday, Illicit History for Patrons with Ava Gollinger, who is Hugo Chavez's lawyer and one of the writers of the Venezuelan Constitution. Uh, we're talking about the Bolivarian Project. A lot of stuff there. Patreon.com slash TMBS or, of course, the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel or on iTunes. And uh, see you tomorrow at 7. Uh, check out the Antifada at patreon.com slash the Antifada. They recorded yesterday. I don't know the details, but uh, they should have a new one up uh, shortly. Uh, Matt? Some members only content. Three hours and 20 minutes of me narrating Hope Leslie by Catherine Maria Sedgwick. It's volume two, chapters one through seven, and hopefully that's the second to the last uh, installment of that. Dipset. 
All right, folks. Um, heading to the fun half. Six four six two four six four six. Post roll. Oh right. Thank you. Brendan gets credit on that one though. You just didn't hear him. He was. You didn't project enough, Brendan. Well, here we go. Um, folks, is it another bra one? Just a reminder. Calming Comfort by Sharper Image is it the luxurious weighted blanket that mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged, so you can sleep better, feel great, stress less. Calming Comfort weighted blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee from the Sharper Image. You get a 90-day uh, money-back guarantee. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to calmingcomfortblanket.com. Use the promo code MAJORITY at checkout to receive 15% off the displayed price. Again, that's calmingcomfortblanket.com, promo code MAJORITY, because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep. See you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? Who, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males of back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males of back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner T's song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, what do you mind? I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. The alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black. We are back. Sam Cedar on the fun half. You know, we um, we talked with uh, Kevin Cruz and um, and Julian Zelizer um, in their book Fault Lines about the impact of the right wing media over the past 40, 45 years in um, sort of driving what has been up until I think fairly recently an asymmetric polarization or force that was creating polarization. 
one thing that did not come up, and I've been saying this for two and a half years, the moment Donald Trump is gone, the media will snap back. Well, with the victory of the Democrats in the House, the media snapped back pretty, you know, they, their, their tendency is so dramatic in this way to get to an equilibrium where they can basically say a pox on both your houses. This is both your faults. Um, here is um, on CNN. Jim, how do you pronounce his name? Skudo. Skudo. Uh, <laughs> just sort of like saying, like, look, we need, we need there to be a dramatic cliffhanger here. We cannot do coverage of politics without some semblance of us being able to maintain arm's length from both of your positions, regardless. You say sun comes out during the day. They say sun comes out during the night. We can't take a position on this, even though our job is to deliver some of the basic truths and then go from there. I mean, when we talk about polarization in this country, if the media cannot, as a whole, simply agree on some very basic facts, the sun is in the sky during the day. It's not during the night. That's almost definitional. At least, you know, in New York, let's say. That is a problem. But watch how Jim Scutio um, really tries to make this about the... Now, we know nothing moved on the government shutdown when there were Democrat when the Democrats controlled no part of our government. Two weeks ago, the Republicans controlled everything and they didn't pass a budget. They were elected to change uh, things in Washington, to get things done. They have an ambitious agenda that extends far beyond uh, immigration here. Do they not have the risk of being portrayed as obstructionists here rather than, than doers? <laughs> What's the opposite of time dilation? Like time stagnation. Right. It was just like, I'm sorry, we just had a hiccup where you guys were out of power for two years and we're not going to... Uh, like who in it, will you replay that? Because you know what's also amazing is there's no it is it is the most passive yeah. voice yeah. possibly used. Like what if aliens come down here and have no sense of context? Could they maybe say, like, you guys are obstructionists? Go ahead. They were elected to change uh, things in Washington, to get things done. They have an ambitious agenda that extends far beyond uh, immigration here. Do they not have the risk of being portrayed as obstructionists here rather than than doers? I, what what was the answer to that? You know what I Did love? Know? There, there was no satisfying it wasn't, it answer. It wasn't right? clipped to that, but the guy he's talking to, Scott Jennings, was a policy director for Mitch McConnell for a long time. So. Right. Wait, and I thought that was Matt Lewis there. Yeah, I mean, Matt, Matt Lewis, Lewis is a they look you know, exactly Republican alike. columnist, so I would imagine not much, but. But uh, what I think is, for, I could picture them like in morning prep, just being like, God, it's, it's going to feel great to be able to repeat exactly the same thing again that we right. used to always repeat. But it's going to be so relaxing. Wait, 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 like, uh, like, but portrayed by whom? Like who? Like, like what? Like, like yeah, yeah. By, by me. <laughs> by me. Like, as I am doing right now. I'm trying to give Who's you doing all this portraying I'm, in this country? <laughs> I'm trying to give you a prediction as to where I'll be tomorrow <laughs> in, uh, in talking about your obstruction. Is this not an opportunity for us to resort to our absolutely mind-blowingly lazy cliches that we have been forced out of by a profoundly mentally ill president? I completely forgot that the president said, I will own the shutdown. In other words, I will totally own the sh shutdown. I completely forgot that happened. I'm sorry. Now that President Trump has declared martial law, the Democrats are in charge of the House, though. This wasn't exactly on their agenda, is it? <laughs> Could this be seen as a do-nothing, no-compromise Congress by President Trump declaring martial law? By all of you going into the camps, aren't you in some way participating in this? Like, really, I mean, like, look, if you didn't go into the camps, 
maybe the camps wouldn't be full. I understand some would say in Democratic congressional offices that they're being forced into camps. But that being as it may, the American people want action. Um, let's go to the which is the one uh, with. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Which is the one where he um, where uh, Anderson Cooper can't believe it. He has that look of surprise. On it's uh, about the racism one. Oh, the racism. OK. Yeah. Here it is. Um, now, uh, here is a uh, clip of AOC on uh, 60 Minutes. We can't, um, we, uh, you know, CBS, for whatever reason, doesn't believe in fair use. And so um, they have an issue with us using video, but the audio is uh, good enough. It'll cause you to listen to it. But we did want to put the picture of Anderson Cooper looking very surprised by what um, AOC is saying. Like, you know, this like is a perturbed dog. This is, but this is part and parcel of the same thing of Jim Scutio saying, like, isn't it possible that you'll be portrayed as obstructionist? Like, like, did someone kidnap everyone in the media and 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 then bring them up? Like, is it like one of those things, like Men in Black situation, where they all get they they cannot aggregate any information or context? or know anything outside of that very moment? Like, are they reborn at every single moment, someone in the Democratic Party or someone to the left of them, or even to not to the left, or just someone nominally on the left says something, it's as if they're like approaching it with virgin ears. Like, I know nothing about the world or anything. I'm just shocked to hear this. Are you saying there's something, do you think that, that that the Republicans are in some way motivated by race? Really? Here's AOC talking to Anderson Cooper. You don't talk about President Trump very much. No. Why? No. Because I think he's a symptom of a problem. What do you mean? The president certainly didn't invent racism, but he's certainly given a voice to it and expanded it and created a platform for those things. Do you believe President Trump is a racist? Yeah, yeah, no question. How can you say that? <laughs> when you look at the words that he uses, which are historic dog whistles of white supremacy, when you look at how he reacted to the Charlottesville incident where neo-Nazis murdered a woman versus how he manufactures crises like immigrants seeking legal refuge on our borders, it's, it's night and day. I like how she could just say, like, by every observable action, both stated and like what? Like, I mean, it really is like a where do you begin answer. Right. Like we could go to the stuff you guys talk about all the time, his Twitter feed, his or we could go to policy like temporary protected status for Haitians. We go to the children that have died under his policies because of the motivation of racism. Where would you like to start? And maybe you could wipe the confused, credulous, idiot look off of your face <laughs> right. while I establish reality. Right. I mean, there's varying degrees. I think she showed uh, the the proper restraint and and walked him through it like one would a, a a not a totally like not a toddler, but one would maybe a junior high student. But she could have also just said, "I don't know, is there gravity?" Like, I mean, yes. <laughs> there How could can you say that? <laughs> Yeah, I just. I wow. mean, for what it's worth, I I get the concept. I know some people. I know there's like very literalist people. Well, that when, are what like, do you think happened? Go, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying. I understand some people. Like, hey, it's not Anderson Cooper's. Like, he's supposed to pretend to be objective, and he can't editorial. And it's like, okay, I'm not saying that Anderson Cooper. I don't think we're saying like Anderson Cooper should be like, yeah, yeah. We all know he's a racist piece of garbage, but like, really, that level of just incredulity, right. like. Not even like, well, I understand why a lot of people hold that view, but do you really feel as a congresswoman? You, there's or, or, ways, or so many ways you know, to frame or this. What's your perspective on why what's, that's the case? Yes, literally. As opposed to everyone else's perspective, as yeah. opposed to the white nationalists who say that Donald Trump is giving us a uh, uh, voice. As opposed to how can right. you say that? Right. What? Really? I mean, that was like as if she was like, I mean, like she might as well have been talking about Jeb Bush the way he said it. Right. Yeah. It, How I mean, can it, you say that? Right. Like, what do you what what is the voice of incredulity that you use for other people? <laughs> like what's left? It's really. Uh, stuff. How can you say that? And um, here is AOC 
explaining to Anderson Cooper that the knee jerk, and just as you know, uh, uh, when we were talking to Julian uh, Zelizer earlier, this idea that the uh, conservative uh, movement, the Republican Party, is for limited government. No, they have different priorities. Uh, that's all. These are two parties with different priorities as to how you spend money and who should pay for it. The Republicans feel the wealthy should pay less. The Democrats largely feel the wealthy should pay more. Republicans want to spend the money on stuff that specifically enriches them. <laughs> Democrats largely, at least theoretically, want to spend it on helping those people who um, who fall through uh, the cracks and provide a sa social safety net. And there are also uh, elements of the Democratic Party, hopefully growing, and I think uh, are, who want to expand universal programs and services by government. This is pretty all straightforward stuff that I would hope that after the 25 years in uh, on CNN that Anderson Cooper has picked up. But there is like some notion of like, remember, doing an interview, got to maintain a certain amount of incredulity here. Got to be just like it's I'm like, I don't know where any of this is coming from. How are you going to pay for all of this? No one asks how we're going to pay for this space force. No one asked how we paid for a $2 trillion tax cut. We only ask how we pay for it on issues of housing, health care, and education. How do we pay for it? With the same exact mechanisms that we pay for military increases, for the Space Force, for all of these uh, ambitious policies. There are Democrats, obviously, who are worried about your effect on the party. Democratic Senator Chris Kuhn said about left-leaning Democrats, if the next two years is just a race to offer increasingly unrealistic proposals, it'll be difficult for us to make a credible case we should be allowed to govern again. What makes it unrealistic? How to pay for it. We pay more per capita in health care and education for lower outcomes than many other nations. And so for me, what's unrealistic is, is what we're living in right now. There you go. Yeah, I, you know what I would like to do? Chris Coons I would like to see AOC with a debate with Chris Coons. Chris Coons, of course, incidentally, is the one who wants to return the filibuster. Well, Chris Coons is also just another Delaware right. like yeah. credit card subsidy senator. I he's mean, the one he's, up for re-election in 2020. Yeah, I mean, Chris Coons is an utter mediocrity. The only reason he's in the Senate is because he lucked out by getting to run against Christine O'Donnell. He has nothing distinguishing to his name and has done nothing to forward any type of national cause whatsoever. She's done to more be, to in be a couple fair. of months in national life than he's done his whole career in the Senate. To be fair, he does have that proposal to have the state legislatures pick senators again. That was... <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I, was gonna say, I wow, actually I'm believe joking. that. Yeah, I would believe that. Like, in the nature of compromise, how about we, we just, you yeah. vote to restore the filibuster in exchange? I would like to offer that the Senate selects, uh, state legislators select have decided that maybe the best way to pick senators would be to allow the board of directors at the Lincoln Center to uh, to choose them for every state. Anybody? Also, we got to just keep hitting like her proposal is hard is easier on the oligarchs than Jimmy Carter's was in the late 70s. We had a 90 percent rate in the 50s. The economy worked great. Sweden still has a 70 percent rate. They're a global Actually, a lot not of even competitive. They're a global superstar in terms of economic performance. Like, this is just total nonsense. Well, you say it's nonsense that we could sustain oh, a, excuse uh, me. a class. An august, I could see an august economic voice is coming up here. <laughs> you, you, you think it's nonsense that we could actually deal with a tax rate that over the past 100 years was actually the, uh, the norm. Right. We had 30 some odd years of a tax rate that was a top marginal rate that was above 70 percent, at least. Coincided you, with some some good growth. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, what they called the the Great Compression, where wealth inequality. Now, there was a lot of factors involved in that. And, you know, it's not exactly the same, but that is not dispositive of the uh, uh, of the value of this uh, tax. But um, here it is. Fox News weighing in again on the uh, proposal 
that is in no way uh, radical. But uh, getting even in this clip, you can see the value. I mean, to them, it is, you know, it's like the spread of the plague. But when Julian Castro, who at the DNC, was it in 2016 or 2012 he spoke? I don't know. I think it was 12, but I'm not sure. I just remember when that guy spoke being bummed out by, by well, he, his speech, which was very much about like, you know, if you have the the perfect grandmother like I did, you can achieve anything in this country. For those of you who don't, well, that's your 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 SOL. It was 2012. But here is um, uh, Fox and Friends. And good for them talking about this proposal to tax not the rich up to 90 percent, but any dollar made over three million, 10 million. I think it should be closer to three million, but I think the Democrats are saying 10. But uh, up to 90 percent here, of course, is Stuart Vaughn. Agreeing with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on a plan to skyrocket taxes for the super rich to fund their socialist agendas. Pause it for one second. Wait a second. Like now, this is Fox and Friends. Like, didn't they get the memo? You don't want to say the super rich. Yeah, you I was just say, say the wealthy. Right. I, that that's not even going to pull well. Keep it simple. There. Keep it simple. Say tax working America. The, the disgustingly yeah. rich yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with their agenda to tax a handful of people you never meet and probably don't like. Right, and <laughs> have so much money they couldn't possibly spend it, even if they hired an entire company full of people who were in charge of just doing nothing but spending it. I can support uh, folks at the top paying their fair share. There was a time in this country where the top marginal tax rate was over 90 percent. Even during Reagan's era uh, in the 1980s, it was around 50 percent. All right, here to react is host of Varney and Company on the Fox Business Network, Stuart Varney. <laughs> How strongly would you like me to react? To that? I mean, you, you want to Go blow up or something? Taxed at ninety percent. Why bother? Uh, did he? Did the gentleman refer to a fair share? Yes. A fair share is ninety percent for the government and maybe ten percent kept by you. That hardly seems fair to me. Looks to two points. Looks to me like, number one, the far left is now calling the shots for the entire Democrat Party as you roll up towards 2020. At least so, two, two of the bigger names. Uh, okay, okay. Well, what's the sense of working but they're making, <laughs> oh, they're making all of the headlines, they're making all of the running, and Nancy Pelosi constantly has to talk about whether she's going to go with this or with that. The far left is making the running, and that's very dangerous for America. What does that mean for our economy? Because well, what's the point. incentive of working hard, and don't the people who contribute that much to society and are creating the big businesses, yes. aren't they helping our economy? It would be very bad news for America's economy. Right now, we've got a boom in progress here. We've got strong growth. You saw those jobs numbers on Friday, over 300,000 new jobs, manufacturing making a real comeback, wages going up at a, at a very strong rate. You start imposing tax increases like they're talking about there, and you slow that economy down dramatically. That's what happens when you raise taxes. So I don't, but I, I've got to tell you, Brian, I don't think they care. If you ask them, <laughs> what's the effect of this on the economy? I don't think they care. Well, they simply want to stick it to the rich and stick it to no, President Trump. No, they pay Trump. for their big programs. Yeah, okay, Medicare for all, and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has this green uh, agenda which has to be paid for with money from the rich. It simply won't work. So <laughs> well, it sounds like it'll work. It didn't really make an argument that it wouldn't work. It's just that he doesn't think it's fair to the super wealthy. And uh, the folks on the phone, I would, like, like, the, I guess I, I don't want to overstate this, but one of my fantasies would be to sit on the couch with those three and explain marginal tax rates to them. That simply isn't fair. Rupert I'm Murdoch has to buy working. human slaves. I'm going to stop working after I make three million that year. I'm going to stop sometime, like, I don't know, like, stop in you know, February. I made my three mil. I'm just going to coast from here. Because I don't want to pay 90% taxes. I mean, that's just, it's absurd. I will say on the flip side, I'm pretty glad that they aren't spending a lot of time going after our strongest asset. Which is? Chris Coons. Chris, exactly. Because, you know, there's some oh, wait a second. pretty formidable figures Hold on in the for Democratic a second. Party. We got some breaking news. Oh, this is 
Wow, this is an exclusive from the Gateway Pundit. An exclusive, uh, just breaking. Yorktown elitist and Bronx hoaxer Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez went by Sandy well into college at Boston University. There is a video associated with this. Can we uh, scroll down, see the, uh, wow. Where the heck did she get this Sandy from? Oh, there's a picture of her. Look at that. She's wearing a, some type of tank top. Interesting. Very, uh, in fact, Ocasio-Cortez went by Sandy at least into her junior year. Is there a way that we can do At the do, university. Can you get like a people's. How can you say that? <laughs> can we this get is, like a people's restraining order? No kidding, right? Like, like I look at, like, especially this gateway pundit guy. And if you ever looked at any pictures of him. I think that attractive man. Yeah, there should. It's not, I'm not even making. I'm not even making that. I'm not even being that cheap. Although I'm perfectly willing to be. I'm talking a certain, a certain, call Interpol look about him, and then you combine that with this fixation no on AOC. It's very bizarre. Now, is there an actual video where we see someone refer to her as Sandy? I mean, that would be devastating. No, but in the uh, in the really embarrassing d- video of her dancing, she was credited as Sandy Ocasio Cortez. Oh my in god! The video credits. That's so oh, she didn't no. wipe that. She she didn't I get the leftists to clear her history. I can't. Uh, I mean, guys, you know, this is the when it's hard for us. Like, what's the balance of propaganda and intellectual honesty? Because that's I'm I'm running up against it. Yeah, well, I don't know what to say. Where's the guy who was able to keep to whitewash um, Obama's? Uh, birth certificate. Why couldn't he get ahead of this story? Yeah. Getting sloppy. Yeah. I guess I heard Bill Ayers' his health isn't doing great. Maybe that's why. Hey. All right, let's go to the phones. You call him from a. Oh, well, I forgot to hold on. I thought they got it yesterday. Didn't we do a story on Friday from like Red State of, of them being like, you know, guys, like, do you realize like posting videos of her being like likable in college isn't exactly working for us? And right. Exactly. Acting like a general bunch of sort of like deranged stalker weirdos maybe is not the most effective maybe way. Maybe don't interpret that feeling of excitement you're getting as this is good for our side yeah. and more like <laughs> interrogated a bit. Yeah, it's I'm not, going yeah. to have to watch more videos yeah. of her dancing. Yeah, to maybe to the you should interrogate uh, your own psychosexual issues. How many before? of us have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez high school video in our Google searches? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the problem is inside the building, guys. Calling from a six three one area code. Who's this? Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Sam, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, actually, I was I was calling about just that crap you've been talking about with AOC. I was. You were talking on uh, my, Michael from Long Island. Uh, hello, you were Michael. talking on Friday about. Uh, you were talking on Friday about that clip where, you know, Anderson Cooper is uh, acting all horrified about the whole idea of progressive taxation and different ways that she could have played, uh, you know, against that kind of crap. And the one that I, you know, always want somebody to say is to, to say, well, yes, Anderson, you know, at some point, maybe, you know, TV star pretend journalists who make eight figures will have to actually contribute something. And, you know, and, and, Viacom might actually have to give back a little bit of of what they take from our from our country, and, and I never hear anybody talk about you know the incentives that 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 um, the Anderson Coopers and the Chuck Todds are working with that they they all are net beneficiaries of Trumpism. Yeah, I they, mean, they, yeah, their, I, I don't... Taxes, their taxes have gone down. Their their com- Look, their employers. Anderson Cooper, in, in... Ander, Anderson Cooper was um, he 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 comes from an extremely wealthy family, I think. Um, and sure. and I don't I don't think that is the issue. Like, I don't think that's why they responded to it. Although I will say this, I think it might be helpful for politicians to do that because it will make them. Le- more hesitant to raise it, right? If 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 what they're getting paid um, 
you know, uh, makes it more more hesitant for them to raise, you know, sort of such surprise at that. I, I, I think I th that could be helpful. I think that, like, the liberal mindset is always to assume goodwill on everybody's part. But, you know, if you look at the class of, you know, the, the superstar TV journalists and the people actually making editorial decisions at the New York Times and the companies that own the news outlets. How can you say that? These, these, these are all people who, who, who don't know anybody who was victims of right. Trumpism. And they're all people whose taxes have gone down and whose power over government and over you know, labor is being enhanced by, by, by what we're seeing. And, no, and I, what I don't see, you know, I think there's like this sort of uh, you know, Pollyannish view of people who go on, well, you know, and, and I, I guess it's hard because, it's like, if you went on Hayes some night and started talking about the interests of, of Comcast in, you know, in 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 right putting the most mo the most uh, you know nice in putting the best face on on Republican po policy, you know, from basically from from morning until eight o'clock, you know, except for the, except for the, or until, except for the three hours at night, would you get asked that? I, I, I think that's, it would be the problem. I, I, I mean, I, I do know that like, you know, in the past, Hayes has actually did, you know, on his weekend show, I think he did like a full blown, uh, like 30 minutes uh, on Comcast. And he said, you know, it was, it was okay. But yes, I think for someone like myself, uh, in that position, um, I mean, I've I've said maybe not been that explicit uh, when it's come up, but yeah, I, I think broadly speaking, if you say that enough um, about uh, the specific company in particular, you will be gone. And largely, I think yes, people who are going to challenge the um, the status quo don't have terribly long careers in broadcast media. And I think that's absolutely yeah, and, true. But and, I listen, I, I appreciate the call, and, Michael. I appreciate the call. Thanks. Um, I mean, I think that's true. I don't think that's their motivation. I really don't. I don't think Chuck Todd is like, I got tax breaks, because Chuck Todd's going to make a ton of money regardless. Um, I do, however, think there may be value for politicians to say that but you know again those politicians more often than not are also uh extremely wealthy so you know there's some con in congress who have more sort of ability to do that but i think it could be helpful i mean to in, in some context but yes it would be a short-lived uh, opportunity Calling from a 919 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello? Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, uh, I'm Natan. I'm calling from India. Uh, Natan from India. What's on your mind? Yes. Uh, I uh, I heard your show last week. Uh, you were talking about uh, Tulsi Gabbard and uh, uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi. Yeah. Yeah, and so there's a there's a really good article on the Intercept, which uh, describes her ties to Modi, and uh, yeah, I could hear like I think Michael spoke about you know how can anybody support Modi because he's he's like he's almost a murderer, and I think like if you read that article, you like uh, really get an insight into uh, how she is even funded by uh, right wing Hindu nationalists in the U.S. Who yep. have ties with the RSS in India? Yeah, I have the like, uh, the, and the RSS. Just so people yeah, know, is like a far right, almost paramilitary, extreme far right Hindu nationalist group, which is sort of almost like I'm not saying it's a directly equivalent, but almost like say KKK and Republican Party, or KKK and the Democratic the Party and the, the Jim Crow South. Really. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's, it's like almost like it's very similar to like Mussolini uh, organizations. 
like it's in in the same vein yes and yeah. and also like if you if you read this article and it, it's it's amazing that you know she claims to be a progressive and she supports modi because modi like modi even now there are so many human rights violations that he has done in india even after coming into power and i'm not even talking about uh, what he did in 2002 in gujarat where like he is directly responsible for the deaths of like thousands of people like uh, last i think a couple of months back uh, the army general who was responsible for controlling the gujarat riot came out and said that uh, when he arrived in gujarat he was made the whole army was made to wait for an entire day during which a thousand people died oh. and modi did nothing like modi called the army and they just sat uh in gujarat they they were able to go out because uh, he did not did not provide any transport for them so he's like it's i don't think anybody can like really claim that modi wasn't responsible for the riots and he and like i i i don't know why pushy gavar can support him well because she's got some very far right hindu politics and she's got some and you know yeah, i i think to be honest i think i think it's quite the real way of understanding tulsi gabbard and maybe what demystifies it and reveals a whole bigger problem that's also unacceptable is you know there's a lot of people in democratic politics who hold great positions on a variety of issues but they support israeli apartheid and they'll never criticize whoever is in power in israel and she has the same approach when it comes to far right hindu politics and of course not all hindu politics is in any way far right but the BJP and the RSS is, and Modi is in, guilty of, of um, you know, certainly of some human rights abuses. And uh, that, to me, if you correlate that with Assad and also her stances, by the way, on like call it Islamic terrorism and on Israel and on drones, uh, that takes her off the table for me. Yeah, and on LGBTQ also. Yes. Although, I mean, I will say on that one, she, all of her positions are up to date now. So that one I don't hit as hard. I I understand why people would be totally suspicious of it, but she's revised all of her positions on those issues. Appreciate the call, Natan. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's go to a six five one area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, is this me? Yes, it is you. Hi, uh, I'm Tony calling from the Twin Cities. Hi, Tony. What's on your mind? Yeah, just uh, first time caller here. Just trying to guess more local question. Um, we recently had Al Franken obviously get booted out, but he's been peeking his head back in the public eye. And I, our midterms went well. We're obviously the best state in the mid in in the Midwest. Um, so I was wondering what you guys' opinion on Al Franken come back to the Senate at all, or because, I mean, Tina Smith is, you know, not not very uh, inspirational, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so would you rather have Al Franken or would you maybe rather have somebody else? Well, I, I mean, Cause I... Because she, you know... Ka I don't... Sorry, Karen... Karen... Uh, Karen... Housley. She, she did pretty close. Yeah, Tony, I don't know um uh I don't know much about uh, her primary challengers. I mean, I think she's a good uh, progressive vote. Do I think that uh, there's room for Al Franken to come back as a senator from Minnesota? No. I, I just don't I just don't no. think so. Not not I, I mean, not, you know. He's is he going to run against is he going to run in 6 years uh with a primary challenge? Uh, is he gonna is he gonna run against Amy Klobuchar? I don't think he should. Well, theoretically, Maybe. if Klobuchar left to run for president or something, I guess. I, yeah, I mean, I don't I see. I don't see. I'll answer it more broadly. I mean, yeah, he it would be silly to primary either of those two candidates. That wouldn't make any sense. There isn't something that distinguishes him significantly from those. But as a general proposition, uh, right. would it be cool if he came back in some capacity, like ran for Congress or a seat opened up in the Senate? Yeah, that's what I'd say. Well, yeah, but, it's just like, like I guess, but not guess as a primary state, challenger very, either. Very locally or Smith, loved, no. and you know. Also, well, maybe he so should like, maybe he should consider running for a mayor or house or something. But no way he should primary either of those two senators. No. Appreciate the call. Not even you know Tina Smith. No. 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 Why? Six years from now, Wait, is he going to primary? Uh, no. 
I mean, and by the way, if she turns out to be bad by that point in six years, then like Elon Omar should yeah, get somebody better yeah, than Franken. Get somebody uh, young right. with a more progressive profile. Put Allison in there. Look, um, Allison, right, right. You know, I, I don't know what position Al Franken might be good for in the context of uh, of a, a Democratic administration, but I could see opportunities there, perhaps. Um, who knows? Who knows? Calling from a 262 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Dee. I'm calling from Waukesha, Wisconsin. Waukesha. How are you? Hello, Dee. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I get that every time. I bet. <laughs> What's going Waukesha. on, Dee? Waukesha. Um, listen, I just called for a couple reasons. Um, one, okay, how do I frame this in 30 seconds or less? Basically, you know, you hear all this stuff, and it, like it's the media's fault, it's Trump's fault. It's the evil, crooked uh, establishment politics fault. But don't you think there's like a huge element here right now going on of sort of it's all of our faults in terms of our culture and needing to redress things like bringing civics back as an important. I know that sounds so old school, but, you know, taking sort of pride in our cities and our, and our counties and then our states and so on and so forth, you know, the whole trickle up theory. Um, because it seems to be everybody's pointing fingers at everybody, but nobody's sort of taking responsibility for the idea that we live in this sort of reality television. Trump's entertaining, so let's go ahead and leave him president because it's interesting kind of thing. I mean, I had a neighbor tell me she voted for Paul Ryan because he was cute and he spoke well. You know, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of thing that seems to inform a lot of people's decision-making, and so it's no surprise to me that we have a Trump for president, to well, be honest, and that won't get more. In the uh, forward that Michael's going to write for my book on blaming the electorate, um, uh, he covers a lot of the. <laughs> no, but I look. No, I listen. I. I'm I, lumping myself in there, by the way. No, no, I, I I understand. I understand what you're saying, and I think um, I think that's. I think that's the case, but okay. Once we've said, like, all right, a huge percentage of our of our population, um, their voting cues are um, are not mature. OK, let's just put it that way. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Which they have, they're say. not they're yeah. not sophisticated in, in terms of what what yeah. they're what they're, uh, they're then what? Right. Like I like I feel like that's what what like why we do this program. Like, well, and I agree, but then can I ask you a question? Then how do you do? How do you deal with this? Then, so you have somebody that lives in the bubble. That no matter what kind of facts you present to them, and I deal with it literally every day. I have friends that are incredibly warm people who've done wonderful things for me. Right? They're they're generous and kind and loving. And then you start talking to them about Obama, and they say all of my best friends are black, and Mahama was a, Obama was a secret Sharia going to bring Sharia. I mean, it's crazy. And they really believe this stuff. So you can't have, I can't make them believe something different. I don't right. want to fight with them all the time. Um, I can go and vote. I get that. But at the end of the day, you either have a democracy that says they're, they're entitled to be blissfully ignorant, for lack of a more politically correct term, right. or they're entitled to ruin the rest of us. And you know what? The problem is letting them ruin the rest of us in, democ in a fair democracy means that children on the border are dying. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, that's my I, issue. No, I, I listen. Sorry. I no, I, I, I totally understand that perspective, so and I totally su subscribe to it. I think like the only, the the only solution to the extent that there is one, and I don't know, you know, yeah. um, that there is one. It is. To sort of do what, you know, we do here on some level is to try and influence the way that the media that relates to them uh, to try and marginalize the the media that is not going to change to okay, try. Can I challenge you then, Sam? Yeah. Can I challenge you? So I, I watch you often on MSNBC, on uh, particularly on Chris's show, and you're very careful about what you say that you wouldn't dare say some of the things you say on your show on MSNBC. Now, is that scripted by MSNBC? Is no. that part of your contract? I'm not trying to be rude here. I'm because there, I, what I wish they had. But wait, wait, what, so what, what, like what, what, uh, aside from, you know, slightly different delivery, okay, what would I not say on that show that I would say here? 
I mean, I don't, I don't use the same. I, I, you know, occasionally I'll swear here. Well, you can't but, cuss, and yeah, I know right, that. Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, I, you know, like in the context. I mean, part of it is like, look, I'm in a different medium on that show, and I'm, I'm not accusing you of being a sellout. No, 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 no. I understand. I understand. I'm in a different medium. I'm talking to a broader range of people who have a, a slightly different uh, common denominator. Uh, but uh, but right. what do you think that I've said on this show that I wouldn't say in that context? Well, I think some of the comments you made, for example, about AOC were incredibly dead on and, and, and CNN's response to her. And what happens is you get this vacuum. Like one of my hugest pet peeves, if one more politician or news commentator says, and the people, I'm the people and I don't agree with you, so don't say you speak for me. I, and listen, I wish they'd cover when, a half an hour somewhere on a I show that would let people like me call in. Well, yes, Sorry, but, but I I'm can't. But D, I can't go on to Hayes's, uh, you know, show, and when we're talking about one topic, go like. And incidentally, but there have been plenty yeah, of times. Sure. There's been plenty of times where I've said. I mean, I'm trying to remember the context, but uh, where I've said like, even on this network, you had people who were saying blah blah blah. You know, I didn't say like. You did that just a couple of appearances ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, remember, I mean, but... I, I I do it, but I can't. I can't change the topic. I mean, I don't. I don't have that. Maybe I, I, if you weren't so beholden right. to the Democratic but, Party, you'd have the courage to <laughs> criticize. <laughs> what, you're like, well, why are you, you talking like about a, AOC? A, a once a month special on your, on your platform where you let people like me call in and say, like, for me, what I would love to do is take one of these pundits or commentators, take literally clip their, their audio and respond to it myself instead of with this vacuum that everybody seems to think. Well, but so you know, we do. You're doing that right now. Yeah. No, she wants yeah, a clip. She wants D. I get it. You want to be able to say pause it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll do that so one guilty. day. I'm Appreciate so it, D. No, okay, D. Uh, well, listen, D. I mean, uh, maybe thank you. maybe you should maybe you should think about launching your own YouTube channel. I did try that, and I was working with one of your <coughs> starters, and he never got back to me. Oh. <laughs> Who? What? He's busy. Matt. Wait, what? What did you? What happened? I called, about a year ago, I, I emailed him and said, you know, I'm really kind of considering oh. maybe starting up a, a podcast, and I didn't know how to do it. I'm very technologically challenged, and um, he was going to help me, and he never got back to me. But you guys are busy, and I'm not really a, a oh, radio man. personality. Could you, pl- could you play yourself well, right. some bong water? No, Matt, right Matt was building his water boat at that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was really... <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll totally get back to you. <laughs> I uh, appreciate. That. Well, <laughs> hang in there. Maybe Matt. Oh will... fuck! YouTube channel, Matt. very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Bye, D. Listen, I, thank you very much for your time. I'm not a. I'm not. You know, once in a while, I get worked up enough to call into a show like this. But no, I'm not really cut out to be a host. I'm not I terribly don't know. funny. No, I think you are. But I, I think I think Matt <laughs> dropped the ball in a major way. We'll see. <laughs> I do do voices. I do a great Valley Girl. So. Oh, all right. Well, let's <laughs> let's save that for another call. Send Appreciate those in the Dropbox yeah, to friend. Matt. I, I right. wasn't gonna do it. All right. <laughs> Email them to Matt. Send them YouTube. sound files. <laughs> keep them keep them updated. Appreciate the uh, call, D. Uh, let's go to the IMs. Jonathan Armstead. D should call more. You didn't. Yeah, she should. Um, you didn't do movie recommendations on Friday. What did y'all see during the break? I'm really only asking to see if I should get around to finishing Bird Box. My God, it moves too slow. I, I have not watched that. I'm no, not terribly not interested. That. I watched uh, Force Majeure over uh, the break, and that was, uh, that was quite good. I've quite been good. watching uh, Babylon Berlin, which is very intense, but uh, it's, it's good. It's fascinating. First Reformed with Ethan Hawke. Uh, it's amazing. I really liked it. What was it for? Oh, first reformed. Yeah, I. Did you tell me that already? I think I did. Yeah, yeah I get that on the list. Not on there though. Didn't didn't see it. Um, I watched about a Buster Scruggs. It's, I really enjoyed that. Right. Coen oh, Brothers on right. Netflix. I've heard good things about yeah. that. I'm in a big western. Is that a mood film anyway. or a series? It's uh, like two hours and forty five minutes. An and I was like, yeah, it's an anthology. Oh, it's an anthology. It's like eight stories. Oh, that's cool. That's uh, cool. Is this a remind you of Old Brother War Art though? Uh, you know, that's one I'm less familiar with, but oh, really? I think that's so. That's my favorite it, it is Coen bit, Brothers. It's probably a bit like that. Yeah. I love Old Brother. 
Glass Siegel, Ben Shapiro totally uh, blew up AOC's plan for taxes, calling it intensely stupid because rich people will just start using tax avoidance strategies. <laughs> it's criminalize the rich, baby. <laughs> I, it's Ben thinks more similarly to us than he realizes. Right. I Reveal mean, your criminal nature, America's capitalist class. The um, what? Well, <laughs> that's just amazing. that's great logic that's great. for any sort of government just, regulation. Well, that is the same logic of the guy who said, you know, if your water go, if your house is underwater because of climate change, you'll just flip it. That's no, I'm saying that that is a Ben Shapiro. Makes that sense. is that is a similar. You'll flip it. You'll just he sell say it. he's saying so. So let's take the le the left's worst case scenario. Your house goes underwater. What are you gonna do? You're gonna sell your house, move. <laughs> <laughs> the the fucking the yeah, philosopher no, prince of the we've American got a, right wing. We've got wing. somebody who's taken freshman economics over. Yeah, here. we got some yeah. logic right there. Uh, I have to say, shameless plug, but I just thought of this. Uh, because Sam Harris does guided meditations. So Mike Racine and I, for the live show, are recording other, like a Dave Rubin guided meditation and a Ben Shapiro guided meditation. And Rubin, you know, of course, is just like, oh, focus on your breath. What's that? A dog? And then, he, you know, <laughs> and then Shapiro just goes into berating you and reminding you of the terms of service and downloading his meditation app. This cannot be used for any other purposes except for your explicit. If you're not relaxed, that's because of you. You haven't fulfilled your fiduciary requirements under the agreement. Colin from Nebraska, we should tax nobody but Stuart Varney. Uh, <laughs> turn up Vega. I thought the debate between Sam and Straka was great until it took a weird turn and Sam ended up explaining to him what comedy is for about 30 minutes. Is the guy uh, <laughs> grifting or is he really that dumb? Sean, I, I actually left. I went in thinking grift and left thinking that dumb. Yeah. I Sean, synergy. <laughs> Sam, you missed what Trump said first thing in his little press conference about the shutdown. He said that he can relate to people not paying their bills. It's probably the only truthful thing he said in three years. Um, apathetic steamroller. Gateway Pundit may have uh, had the scoop about AOC going Sandy for a while, but have you heard the breaking news that it turns out Ted Cruz's first name is actually Raphael? Shocking. Lefty Uno, breaking news. Centoya Brown granted clemency. Oh, good for her. Yes, and Set should release. not have been in prison to begin with. And it's still, I mean, it's great, but she is still on parole. I mean, this is the type, she, this is the, she should be given a massive amount of money by the she, state, to say the least. She was a teenager. A 16 year old right. woman, if I remember correctly, who was sent to prison because she had been. She, like sex trafficked she, she in some way. She literally killed a guy her, who basically was trafficking her, yeah. kid, her kidnapper. Yeah. She killed a guy in self-defense. Where was this? In I think Tennessee? it was in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa Demeter. Well, that's good news, at least a little bit. Did you hear the uh, news was granted clemency? Yes. Um, uh, spent last night fighting right with racists on Reddit who were talking shit about Sean King and about Jasmine Barnes' family, and the feeling was depressed about the world, but this news is great and makes me feel a tiny little better. Yes. Dr. Chaos MD. When Varney touts wages going up as a sign we uh, do not need higher marginal tax rates on the wealthy, is he referring to minimum wage increases that went into effect in, in, the, in this year in 20 states, not to mention municipalities and counties with the massive tra uh, Trump tax cuts? Why did citizens have to mandate higher wages through ballot measures? Shouldn't our benevolent billionaire rulers have just raised wages on their own? Well, look, the, all the results are in for all those corporate tax increases. Um, there was no relationship between uh, any increase in wages and those tax cuts. Um, there was a huge, and I would argue causation, uh, uh, correlation between uh, those uh, corporate tax cuts and stock buybacks. Park, what do you think about Noam Chomsky's point about capital flight as a mechanism of control against meaningful change in policy? The whole narrative involving economic performance gives all the power to the wealthy technocratic pseudo state, which means unless we create a really radical reform, the market can tank meaningful reform deliberately. Yes. Thoughts on when the uh, on that when considering these ambitious proposals. If we look to the market as a metric of success, our success depends. You know, I, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but well, first of all, we shouldn't. 
I mean, I think you're talking about the market in general as opposed to uh, the stock market. But there was a uh, a move back in like 93 or 94 to recalculate the way that we did the GDP. I think it was the GDP at that time. I don't think it was the GNP. Um, and which would involve, which would uh, factor in externalities, would factor in cost to the environment, would factor in some type of index in terms of like, you know, uh, people's stress and whatnot. Um, and I think major reforms like that would require um, some measure of of recalculating the way that we even talk about. But I think that would come inevitably. Like I think, you know, the 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 market for CNBC talk and, and Fox business talk is narrow. It's it's very niche. That's totally and, true. But but places like, you know, if Corbyn gets the power in the UK, I mean they're threatening it was like wholesale capital flight to totally tank the economy. You know, I mean there is a lot of mechanisms that go beyond the stuff that doesn't matter for normal people as much. I I, I find it unlikely. I think that's more I think there's more potential for that in Europe, frankly, Definitely. than there is in the United Definitely. States. It's a I lot mean, harder to do in the United States. Um, and it's already been done a lot. In the yes. United States. Yes. But at the end of the day, like good luck. I also did you know I in uh, 1968 at a speech at the University of Kansas, uh, Robert F. Kennedy laid out a critique of GDP. Huh. And he said, yet this is one quote, yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children. The quality of their education, the joy of their play, it does not include the beauty of our poetry, the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. And he actually talks about doors and uh, prisons adding to GDP, destruction of redwoods. Right. He actually outlined this critique. When was well, this? 68. I mean, can you March imagine a politician 18. talking about like that today? They would get like, they would just like... <laughs> Anderson Cooper's. And then he'd reference what? Aeschylus. Yeah. Jim Skewed yeah. He's like, what are who's, you who's, uh, you're, really, you're talking about Aeschylus? Po wait, why? Po poetry? <laughs> wait, that's, that's, that's Tucker, though. Poetry? That's crazy poetry? talk. <laughs> Should we get serious? Get JJ serious? Cool. Hey, Sam, what do you have against concrete? Not, not much. Just the fact that you have to like go six inches down and put gravel down. It's a pain in the ass. It's better in schools than border walls. Uh... Yeah. The Mad Mailman. Thought you might like to know, Cynthia. Yes. Centoya Brown. Uh, secularist Satanist. Uh, you guys should do a random rush type of thing whenever Joe Rogan is streaming a conversation with some mouth breather at the same time, as in right now. <laughs> JB. I'm beginning to hate the word polarization. This sounds too much like both sides are to blame equally. I, you know, I agree with that. Secret identity politics. Waukesha caller needs different friends. TMBS is my jam. Sam, uh, can we here in uh, North Carolina borrow your New York State Board of Elections since North Carolina currently does not have a State Board of Elections to deal with the debacle in North Carolina's 9th House District? Yeah, it's crazy. Adam Cokehead, Sam, I went through Dave Rubin's set subreddit. <laughs> Dude, person after person said the Sam Cedar video showed them the light and they realized how dumb or hollow this whole thing is. Can That's you guys awesome. please say something super mean about Dave? Look. Uh, but okay, after Sam does, can I just say after Sam does what he's about to do? Yes, I will. Well, can we play that? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, let's oh. do this. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything super mean about Dave. I'll, can I just Ruben. say that we spend so much time talking about how stupid Dave is, we don't spend enough time talking about what an asshole he is. Now, look, I don't know. I, listen, let me put it this way. I'm not in charge of writing the code of ethics for people who do political talk shows. OK, I'm not a columnist for The New York Times who would, you know, make someone famous regardless of what they spew into the the atmosphere, the intellectual atmosphere, the intellectual ether or ether. web, yes, or or the darkness the of the dark, web, yeah. whatever. But look, plenty of times on this program, 
I say, you know, I don't know. So I'm not going to comment. All right. I don't know international politics that well. I don't. Uh, when I don't know something, and there's plenty of other things domestically, I don't know. And I'm not afraid to say that because that, um, in my mind, th th that's the most honest thing for me to say. And it, 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 it's a function of my integrity and what I feel like I owed the audience and not just what I owe my audience, what I just generally owe society. Don't pontificate about something that I have no idea about that is serious. So when a guy gets elected um, to what, what is it, the fifth biggest? Fifth biggest democracy in the fi world. Fifth biggest democracy in the world. I wasn't 100% sure, so you notice, like I turned to Michael uh, because I wouldn't say it. And, and I have a list of just fifth what he, Fifth largest economy as well, yeah. I have a list here of what he did on day one, I think it was. Where is that? I oh, is that the uh, Pogi uh, tweet? Yeah, I can't remember. In day one, he eliminated, I could tell you off the top of my head, he, he took out uh, protections for LGBT people, which I've heard something about Dave Rubin being gay. Uh, he <laughs> overturned, uh, lowered the minimum wage. He put the Amazon protections for the Amazon as well as all of the indigenous communities inside the Amazon. He put them inside the hands of uh, someone who's an agribusness lobbyist. A third of his uh, part of his government is military. And um, there was actually one other really terrible thing, which I'm totally forgetting. It was like the boys will wear blue and girls will wear pink stuff and the SJWs, which I think. Right. Yeah. Well, he promised an end to socialism and political correctness in his convention speech. But I'm trying to think of just like straight up policy. Uh, and he's oh, he's promising to gut uh, labor protections. Yes. And this is on day one. And, this is and, all. And now look, you could also, you know. It's been going around, you know, people have been a little bit talking about maybe this guy's a fascist or maybe not. This guy's definitely a fascist. Like if you if you check out like any of the news <laughs> at all, it's hard to imagine um, that you wouldn't come across, uh, you know, at least some notion about this guy. He said stuff like, like he told a woman like a. Uh, uh, he, he referred to black activists as like animals. He uh, said something. Um, there he was told a woman that she wasn't ugly and she wasn't attractive enough to, to deserve rape to be raped by him in Congress. He'd prefer to have his son die in a car accident than be gay. Right. I mean, the military regime made its biggest mistake was it didn't kill enough people. Now, the flip side of this, let me just also say there's an out for you in this situation. You could say, you know what? I haven't really done anything on this, so I can't, I can't really make a comment about that guy. Like, this happens all the time. Well, the you trouble take... is, though, is he did do something about it because he, as we did on this show, he appeared on a pro-Bolsonaro YouTube propaganda channel to talk about ideas. Well, so, a trouble, so the problem is typical Ruben fashion. Clearly, he knows nothing, but he did propagandize well, for I'm not going to let my ignorance get in the way of a couple of uh, clicks that I can bring Indeed. over some audience. Uh, but putting that aside, here's exactly what you should not do when you accidentally like, oops, I just supported a fascist who incidentally, if Dave Rubin takes a trip down there, we'll, we'll see in two or three years if he could travel with his husband there. Continue. What is your opinion on Brazilian Prime Minister uh, Bolsonaro? Uh, no, pause it. Now, look, it's easy. Look, no. I am no. not going to. This is the one thing where I'm going to give him a little bit of a break because um, I mispronounce things all the time. You do, but not that badly. Bol 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 Bolsonaro. I mean, that's a lot. I, can I say that? Let me, just, let me just say this really quick. But listen, if you, because I don't think it's just mispronunciation. I don't think he recognizes so much this guy. I don't think he said it. That no, much. this is, he's never no, said the this name. This is a guy who is like the center of global news right now in the last couple of days. That's like, you're not looking at your notifications, news notifications on your phone. But, it, the, the, but all that is fine. It's just that, you know what you do in that situation? I don't know. I don't know. But. Dave has got to project that he actually knows what he's talking about. 
What is your opinion on Brazilian Prime Minister uh, Bolsonaro uh, uh, regarding, oops, there's a lot of things moving here, deforestation of the rainforest. P.S. I'm a Christian, I bake you a cake though. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about him, um, but it sounds like he really hates Marxism and he's, and he's really pushing Brazil to become more of a world leader and that he actually is for capitalism and he's trying to get some of the SJW stuff out of the schools. I just saw a tweet by him a day or two ago. So oh, on that front, and I, as, again, I don't know a ton about him. That all sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> he's trying to get some of the SJW stuff out of the schools. Like... Like uh, like the uh, the things that say like you shouldn't be raping people or uh... well I mean that's well no this is right on top of this guy actually walked it back because it was like an international slight international embarrassment for a second amidst all the other things they're doing but his minister said boys will wear blue girls will wear pink. And actually had to say, oh, actually, everybody can wear whatever they want. Right. Because uh, even that was so. SJWs have got to them. Well, already. no, because, well, the, the, because the economists in the Wall Street Journal that have no problem with fascism are like, we certainly support the, like, murdering of all the indigenous peoples to help our petro companies. But we feel slightly uneasy it's about the, look like. It's going to awkward when we yeah. take pictures of your students uh, right. that they're yeah. all wearing. Torturing blue... gay kids in school isn't really great for now, the brand. Now, what, uh, tell me about this, though, uh, Michael. So Brazil seems to be like becoming big, like they're they're back in the news. <laughs> what did he say that they're like he wants to make Brazil? What did he say? Like how did he put that? He said like more respected again, yeah. or he, or great again. Trying to be a leader, like a goal, a global player. Yeah. These guys have been sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, they were totally totally irrelevant under like. <clears throat> There was this thing that did happen from like 2003 to 2010, at least, or 12, where like they had stipulating the criticisms of these things, but they had the Olympics, the World Cup. Lula was the most popular president in the world with an over 80% approval rating. The economy grew by leaps and bounds. They took 30 million people out of poverty, and Obama met Lula and said, he's the most popular politician on earth. And they set up a new BRIC trade agreement and alliance with Russia, China, and South Africa, So, which still exists to this day. So some people think that that period actually was really good for Brazil internationally. Yeah, but now they're starting to, what is it, he's called, like, kick it into high gear? Yeah, they're kicking into high gear Because they're getting the SJWs out of school. <laughs> yeah, because now they're, cause, right, because now, uh, several months following the gunning down of Marielle Franco, who was an Afro-Brazilian lesbian who fought against police violence as a city councilor, and they haven't arrested anybody. They're taking it up a notch by saying we're going to actually formally discriminate against and terrorize gay, transgender, and lesbian people. Which actually, another thing, incidentally, Brazil actually kicked it into high gear by having a woman president, Dilma Rousseff, and by being ahead of a lot of uh, Western countries in gay rights. Two SJWE. Very SJWE. Look, this is one of those things, like you know, um, you know that that old threat, like I'm gonna punch you so hard, like your you know your mom is gonna you know get a black eye or something. Like this is one of those situations, like where um, Barry Weiss should be fired yeah. because yes. of this. <laughs> like, like, yes. So Hashtag fire Barry. Hashtag fire Barry. And just and by the way, I'm and there's this is just for pure incompetence and stupidity. That's it. For being bad. Intellectual dumb way. Yeah, for being a fucking moron. The Barry intellectual Weiss, dumb way. This would be the, the closest equivalent I could think of is if somebody flew me to go to North Korea or I just did like a North Korean YouTube propaganda video and I was just like, you know, people are really interested in ideas and collectivizing the means of production and then somebody, and then I get a letter <laughs> and I'm like, Kim Jong-Sheen? Well, I don't really do much. I have to do more research, but uh, I've heard that he's uh, taking a lot of land away from the rich people, which I like. <laughs> and he was really good about stepping over. They didn't. They didn't South Korea. Yeah, like he, the yeah, South Korean really guy didn't into, walk yeah. over the line there. He stepped over, which I think is pretty cool. He's, t- he's really kicking it into gear with the the peace and the weapons. So uh, I don't know enough, but he's got uh, great public he, transportation. He's got great public transportation, but so I think he's actually uh, he's doing a really good job. But I would have really to learn job. more. But I don't know. But I don't know. I don't know. Kim Suil. <laughs> But Dave, seriously, let's let's sit down and talk and have a real conversation. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> He's, you know, we spent a lot of. T- I mean, you know, Dave's obviously an. Ob- I think I don't even consider calling Dave dumb to be like, 
like polemical. I think it's, it's a, descriptive. It's just right. a descriptive. But right. he's smart enough to know not to debate you. Yeah. Ilmec, I love that caller who spoke on the public's views on a whole, but uh, what you do on Chris's show is more important than you know. It really matters and changed minds. Chris is also one of our sleeper cells. LOL. Not really. LOL. Wow. <laughs> Jay, I only hear Stuart Varney on your podcast. I keep thinking that I'm listening to an infomercial that he's demonstrating a miracle pan that fries without oil. <laughs> Train boy, do you know if the matching funds for Nomiki's campaign is retroactive? I donated a lot since she declared, and it'd be nice if that funding was matched. I live in NYC for what it's worth. Also, I want Dee and Mindy to make a podcast together. I, I, That's a good I would, idea. That actually occurred Matt, to me. Matt, get on it. I, I think so. I think so. I'm not 100% sure about that in terms of uh, the uh, retroactive. Right about now, did you see the portrait I made of you this morning? I already emailed it. I haven't checked the emails yet. No, uh, but I will. Uh, Jay Tingle. I only hear Stuart Varney. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Well, now we know the secret about Jay. He both comes in as Jay and Jay Tingle. Uh, Rick Kansas spending me- uh, Rich Kansas spending methods. Is 2019, and we're still screwed, Sam. Okay. Toddish. Fly, Eagles, fly. Bald, baldy society. There is a focused attempt to dox Brooks on the YouTube channel. Please check it out. I don't know if the info is true, but it's a little concerning. Yeah, no, I've been banning a lot of uh, different accounts. It's not, it's, a, uh, they're doxing someone named Matthew Brooks. So it's, as oh. far as doxing goes, it's not great. What idiots. V-Span. V-Spa. Uh, Governor Haslam has granted clemency. To, uh, yes, we know. Thank you. Chris Burdick. Michael, mentioning, oh, brother, where art thou? Reminded me of when Schwarzenegger ran for governor out, out here. He literally took broom in hand and without crediting a source, acted out the scene where Charles Durning's corrupt politician character sweeps out the special interests. Soggy flatulence. Uh, David Packman is debating Scott Adams today. Sam, you should have on and pull, poke holes in his pseudo-intellectual back. Scott Adams, the guy who writes Dilbert? <laughs> yes. He's a mind, he's a brain genius guy. He's very pseudo intellectual. Yeah, th- that guy's sort of like pinnacle pseudo intellectual. Somebody that can get their juices flowing and their love tank filled. <laughs> <laughs> no, pull the other part of that. The other part is, I want the Demo- why won't the Democrats. I would vote for a potted plant or a hologram. No, the other no. part, when are the Democrats going to nominate someone that Bill Crystal and I oh. can get behind? <laughs> Oi, oi, oi. So uh, tomorrow night, uh, Donald Trump has announced, I am pleased to inform you, oh, thank you, uh, that I will address the nation on the humanitarian and national security crisis on our southern border Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Uh, that sounds like he might Good stuff for declare a state of emergency hmm. to fund the wall. And so, and... Yeah, I guess I look forward to Rand Paul being like, I'm going to go ahead and support that. Right, exactly. (laughs) Calling from a 651 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, my name is The Chris Lopaco. I'm calling from Minneapolis. The Chris Lopaco. Why aren't you uh, right now working with D to set up a podcast? Um, I, I have my own podcast. It's called the Chris Lopaco experiment and people can find it at patreon.com slash the experiment. It'll take you right to my channel. Okay. So I'm good on that. All right. Fine. Word. <laughs> What's happening? Happy new year. Um, well, you, happy new year to you too. Um, and Merry Christmas, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I've been inspired. I've been inspired, Sam, by your potential, uh, run for Senate. And right. I've been thinking about doing my own run for Senate to unseat Amy Klobuchar here in Minnesota. And uh, before I do that, I just want to come clean, get some skeletons out of my closet real quick. Okay. Um, so they don't come back to bite me. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, I've never heard of skeletons so biting parents, people, but go ahead. Hey, okay. My parents, uh, they really like to gamble. And when I was in fourth grade, we took a family trip to Reno, Nevada. Um, when I got back to school, all the kids started calling me Reno. And I thought it was cool at first, and I played along with it and stuff. But, uh, you know, more more and more, that name became a part of my identity, you know. And pretty soon I started acting like a kid named Reno. And I I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote Reno all over my Trapper Keeper. I told girls I liked that my name was Reno. I mean, I went far, dude. I even, I shaved it into the side of my head. It was bad. 
Yeah. And then, yeah. And it doesn't end there. So the next year, uh, my family took me to Cozumel, Mexico. And when I returned, I told all the other kids I wanted them to start calling me Cozumel. <laughs> it didn't stick. Not at all. Okay. So the girls weren't in the the girls weren't impressed. Nobody would trade their milk for a hot dog at lunch. It was awful. And then I just, I turned to heroin after fifth grade. Oh. Okay. That was a rough summer. <laughs> that, but then, that may have, that you know, may have, it, yeah. it, it, it comes back around though. Cause luckily I found Jesus right before sixth grade was about to start. And he told me just to go by Chris Lapaco. And I said, you know, what about the Chris Lapaco? And he, he said, whatever. And then, so from that point on, I got on the right path and I just want, I hope the voters can forgive me. Okay. I want them to know that I learned from my mistakes. I regret that part of my life, but I try to get better after I make a mistake. And, uh, I think I'm a stronger person because be, I'm a stronger person because of it. Well, so I just want to get that out there and, you know, let everybody know. And I, I'm sorry. All right. Well, Chris, I think, um, you've done the right thing. You were smart to get out ahead of this and in anticipation for your run. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, um, I think, if you were a junior in college and you still went by Reno, there would be some problems. But I think now uh, I think you're safe. So um, uh, thanks for unburdening yourself on the show, bud. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. All right. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. It takes a, it takes a lot of guts to admit something like that. So, all right. Put this uh, tweet up, will you, of uh, Donald Trump and um, – this is happening Tuesday night. Uh, Trump tweets out that I, he is pleased to inform you that uh, I will address the nation on the humanitarian and national security crisis on our southern border Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. I think he gave a clue this morning as to what that was about. But wait, let's just scroll down because I think Phil Hendry. Yeah, Phil Hendry got the <laughs> Uh, good job lying about the Syria withdrawal, the done deal with North Korea, losing billions of dollars in business with the Chinese to the Russians and selling a humanitarian crisis where it was once an invading horde of terrorists. Um, Phil Henry got there first. Good for him. But this, I think, uh, clip from Donald Trump on the White House lawn uh, y today or yesterday? This morning. No, this was over the weekend. Over the weekend, I think, gives you a sense of where the administration is going. They're going to try and declare some type of state of emergency on the border. It's hard to know what fiction they're going to present, but uh, you can bet that Fox is going to go deep into the archives for video footage to cover this. But here is Donald Trump on the White House lawn um, talking about the potential of declaring a national emergency, and I suspect that's what he's going to do Tuesday night. I may declare a national emergency dependent on what's going to happen over the next few days. We have a meeting, Vice President Pence and a group will be going to a certain location that you know where that is, and they'll be having another meeting. I don't expect to have anything happen at that meeting, but I think we'll have, nor does the Vice President, but I think we're going to have some very serious talks come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We have to have border security. If we don't have border security, we're going to be crime ridden and it's going to get worse and worse. Yeah. So he is, you know, this is going to be a big test for the, the media, I think. You know, they blew it on the caravan as far as I'm concerned. The there should be universal, except for, of course, Fox. Um, just outrage. I mean, this is. This is, I don't think, as bad as lying the country into a war in Iraq. Certainly not as bad in terms of the implications of it. This is just a, um, this is just going to be a pretend thing where Donald Trump uh, figures out how to get $5 billion for his emergency. He's going to build a couple of, you know, miles of uh, steel, not the concrete, slats, wall, slats, walls, wall slats. Whatever he's going to, you know, jibber jabber uh, uh, mention. But um, th this, you know, every single person in the media should be basically holding the other Republicans to account because that's what this is really about. Donald Trump is just, you know, 
he's a loose cannon, and the only people who can stop him really are in the Senate, in the Republican Party. So all of those uh, people uh, need to be held to account. They won't be, but that's what should happen. Really, uh, it's insane. It's a little bit insane. Uh, all right, let's take uh, two more calls and then a couple IMs and then we're out of here. Ooh, one more call, let's see. Calling, I know we've got a lot of people who have hang on the phone for a long time. Calling from a 360 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, is this me? Yeah, who's this? Hey, this is Mason from Washington. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. Hi, Mason. What's on your mind? So maybe uh, shifting the tone just a little bit uh, and in kind of the uh, late holiday spirit. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys maybe about how you deal with some family members who are in, let's say, uh, <laughs> um, some industries that are uh, are undesirable. Uh, like, for example, I <laughs> – sorry, I'm a little nervous, first-time caller. Um, my, I have an uncle who's in the health insurance industry and who thinks he's a genius on health insurance policy and economics as a result of it because he makes a good deal of money in the industry. So how do you as an individual or how, do, uh, how, do you, uh, how does the crew – um, talk to or deal with family members who are in industries that really only exist to to take advantage of, of the working class, take advantage of poor people. All right. Um, well, here's what I would recommend is specifically in terms of that guy, uh, because it's the health insurance industry. Go to uh, tarbell.org, I think it is, or the Tarbell. Uh, Google Wendell Potter. Wendell Potter was an insurance executive uh, for about 20 years, and um, then he basically left and has built a, uh, a commentating career basically reflecting back on that time. Uh, I would use Wendell to, like, wh what do you think about this guy who says this? And I would read up about it. What is, uh, what about rescission? What was the, and I would present him with certain percentages, um, you know, because the fact of the matter well, is that, the health insurance industry prior to the ACA in terms of patient protections uh, was the, the whole game was we're going to take your money and we're going to do everything we can to not pay off your claims. It's still largely just, that. Just so you know different. where I'm coming from, I, I, I have an undergraduate degree in uh, both in economics and, um, and political science with a, with a specialty in international relations and in, uh, in economics, a specialty in public uh, 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 Public affairs, specifically. So I, I know a, a good deal about the, the subject. Oh uh, well, then I would from say a, uh, from from an academic perspective. My 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 problem is is that like there nothing in the world will change these people's minds. I mean, their job doesn't exist in the rest of the industrialized world. Right. They how do they not? I mean, they don't realize that really like. Yeah. Their entire existence is predicated upon the exploitation of the working class. I mean, how do you tell these people? How do you how do you extend niceties to these people who really what you want to say is the world and our country would be better off if you jumped off a building? I, I mean, like that's what I want to say. But like, like how do you deal with these people who their their existence is predicated upon exploitation? Oh, it, it's, I, the, I would they're, avoid they're them. I would just avoid them. But I cut them out of your life. I mean, I, there, there's no, honestly, like, <laughs> I, I agree. Just, but... <laughs> you, just gonna keep them at arm's length. I mean, I, I don't know what to, what else to tell you. I mean, for your yeah, own sanity, okay. uh, I would try and tell them, you know, that uh, election day is on a Wednesday this year, and uh, you know, going forward, uh, and 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 that's about it. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Well, the maddening thing is they're Democrats too, so it's not even like they're a Rep they're just they're just. But I, I mean, this is, I, I'm not talking about one, I mean, I, I am talking about one individual per se, but I'm not talking about one individual, if you know what I mean, the broader category of, uh, of people who exist in these industries who, who, uh, who, who think they know a lot more than they really do. <laughs> well, it's also, you know, like, they, I don't know. I, I mean, they're going to have a reality check at some point. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, look, I, I, I hope so. <laughs> if, 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 depending on, you know, like, I don't, I, I try not to judge too harshly people who, you know, you have a family to take care of. This is where you have an opportunity to work. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, something like ICE, for instance, I have a little bit more of a problem with 
than say, you know, working for, you know, a health insurance industry or something, but you know, there's a slight gradation, but it's also a function of the context. But yeah, I would just avoid. Well, yeah, I mean, them. heckling ice should be, should be the political yeah. norm at this point. I mean, if you are, at least in my opinion, if you're, <laughs> if you're present in, in Trump's little Stasi, yeah, I, I have no sympathy for you. All right. Well, I appreciate the call. Hang in there. Uh, but uh, yeah, don't talk to him anymore. <laughs> Um, oh, uh, this is uh, fun. Uh, did we all see? Um, uh, is everybody here seen Vice? No. All right, let's just play this clip, folks. That's it for uh, calls. We don't have any more uh, time today. I'm sorry about that. Um, I saw Vice. I mean, a, a, and Christian Bale did an amazing job. There's just no doubt about it. I I just think that it is highly problematic to make a movie about this because on some level you're humanizing Dick Cheney. Even if you humanize him as a bad person, like I think that movies, you know, if I was the dictator, I would say you're not allowed to make movies about figures like this because you can't do it justice. Um, and really, um, you know, you're going to do a biography of a guy do it in book form so that you can capture nuance, but that people have to really um, make an effort to know this stuff. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what motivated Dick Cheney. Um, or at least I don't care enough. If I don't care enough to read a book about it, I shouldn't have this information and think I have it. What I should know is just he did some very, very evil things i don't use that word that often so scratch the word evil he created a tremendous amount of human misery and i would say probably in the past 25 years it's conceivable he was responsible for you know singularly responsible for um I don't know, I, I, I can't commit, but let's say he's in the top 10 of creating human misery over the past 20 years. I think that's fair to say. And that's pretty bad. Um, and that really should be, that message needs to be driven home more than anything else about him. With that said, I do enjoy the fact that um, uh, Fox and Friends have to sort of deal with this. And Christian Bale uh, did a, uh, a, a tremendous job. Uh, here is Fox and Friends talking about uh, the Golden Globes. Uh, Vice, uh, not many people saw it, but Christian Bale is a really good actor. Pause it. <laughs> I got news for you, Chief. Uh, a lot more people are going to see it now, but uh, go ahead. Uh, Vice, uh, not many people saw it, but Christian Bale is a really good actor and really despises Republicans, especially Dick Cheney, when he talked about bleaching his hair, gaining 40 pounds, uh, bleaching his eyebrows, gaining 40 pounds, and playing the role. He described it like this. He said, I've got to find somebody who can, who can be absolutely charisma-free and reviled by everybody, so he went, that's got to be Bale in it, you know. Thank you, and uh, for all the competition, I will be uh, cornering the market on uh, Charisma Free. What do you think? Mitch McConnell, next. That could be good. Thank you to uh, Satan for giving me inspiration on how to play this role. Okay, so there was Christian Bale uh, being uh, political, which the show otherwise was politics free. Yeah, it's just a real insult to a guy who spent his whole life in public service from Secretary of Defense to Chief of Staff uh, to Vice President of the United States. It makes Bush look terrible, kind of Lisa Rice, uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, especially. All right, congratulations to Carol Burnett, 85 years old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go see it. Unbelievable Christian Bale got uh, political in his representation of a... Um, of a major politician who was, again, responsible for hundreds of thousands of people dying in Iraq, uh, civilians, millions displaced, at least two million internally and two million uh, uh, fleeing the country. And then, you know, um, I, I, you know, just by our own Defense Department uh, records, hundreds of thousands of people. There are other estimates that would put it closer to a million people killed uh, in that specific uh, war of choice. So, um, 
but uh, Fox, they're really upset about how Hollywood hates. <laughs> unbelievable. Really unbelievable. All right, uh, a couple IMs, and then we're out of here. F four more. Save the crew. Uh, the wall should be simply made out of diamond and silk. Uh, dead boomer. Would somebody turn up Michael Brooks? Uh, is the microphone... Uh, yeah, is there something going on with my mic? I keep hearing that from people. Okay. Yeah, you need a little bit of mic work. Okay. Black black Marxists, the progressives are hurt by the soft bigotry of low expectations by Democratic voters. The amount of times I've heard from people of color, non-people of color friends, that they will take anyone that can beat Trump might surprise you. I don't doubt it. I do not doubt it. And the final I am of the day... <laughs> Jimmy Durr. <laughs> Did you see uh, Adam Kokesh owning the cops by refusing to tell them his name and getting arrested when he was parked and walking around the side of the highway at rush hour? Best part was when he asked his friend to hold his camera and he wouldn't because he said he had kids. Owned cops. <laughs> Owned. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Choice was made for the option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I get somehow I lost my drive between the 101 and the 5. Do you know how far the detail takes you? Yeah, I know the clock is ticking. But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright The sun shifted into you While I shifted in and out Right.